All right. Please, in this class, do ensure to take your attendance. Attendance will be shared um, 30 minutes to 15 to 30 minutes before the close of our time. So please ensure to share, uh, take your attendance before leaving the class. It's very important. All right. All right, so that is a way of bringing us to the class. The YouTube channel is youtube.com slash IPM International. So you could, um, you could also be there. Um, the coordinator will post the YouTube link. So in case you are going to join us from YouTube, he has already posted it. So you can just join us from YouTube. Uh, but if you are joining on YouTube, I want, um, you, you have to send us a message as regards to attendance so that you can receive your attendance. Okay, um, before I begin this class, I'm going to give um, one minute um, stretch out because this class is going to run from, um, from 9 to 12. So that's three hours. Uh, but we're going to have break intermittently. So I'm just going to give one minute in the one minute, please feel free to introduce yourself in the chat room. Tell us who you are, your name, your location. Please kindly do that in the chat room um, in, in one minute and we'll proceed. Thank you. Thank you so much and welcome back. I'm sure would have done quite a lot of um, introduction in the chat room. Um, so welcome all the people from Lagos, Ghana, Nigeria and other parts, you're welcome. Okay, so without taking any time or taking much time, we're going to go straight into the, uh, please Abraham Adiola, can you please put off your video for now? Abraham Adiola, can you please put off your video for now? Thank you so much. Um, okay, so we are here to learn about uh, health, safety, and environment management. Um, some announcements will be made um, in the afternoon session where we'll have much time to discuss on, um, on the class. So more of the announcement will be passed in the afternoon class, all right? 
So thank you so much. Please, I will repeat again. If your dressing at this moment does not support a comfortable environment, please kindly turn off your video as um, it may be distracting to some others. Okay, let's just pay attention to the class and uh, we'll have all that we need to learn. Okay, all right. Please, this class is available on YouTube. So in case you need to get to stream, uh, watch it from YouTube, you are welcome. All right. So in, by introduction, we are going to be looking at health, safety, and environment. And we are going to be making special reference to hazard identification and management, which is on job hazard analysis and hazard and effects management process. We'll try as much as we can to see how we'll get this class, this introductory class done on or before 12 o'clock. All right, so that we can go rest and prepare for the afternoon section. All right. Okay, so um, I'm, I'm well aware that most of us here are already uh, practicing um, safety managers. Um, either you're practicing by, by virtue of um, there was need and the organization made you a safety manager or you're practicing because you have um, had some sort of training from the safety field or you have uh, been licensed as a safety practitioner. So whichever dimension you've been operating on, you're welcome. It's important for me to remind us here that the primary role of this class is to help us to learn and build capacity, all right? The secondary function is a personal decision as to whether you want to go for the exam and the certificate, right? So anyone that wish to go for exam and certification will have to pay for those ones. Um, at the moment, we have provided um, a very massive discount for that through our partners. All right. Um, can I say this in this class? There was um, a message that got to us where someone was purporting that IPM is running CIMC programs at $1,300. Please, that's wrong. We've never said anything of such. Uh, we, we don't have such in our, in our program. We understand that CIMC programs are quite um, expensive, yes, but with the arrangement we'll have with CIMC, everyone in Nigeria and anyone running a program through CIMC, be you from Ghana, Kenya, or any part of the world, you get to enjoy a series of, of very great discount compared to what you could have paid if you were to be doing the program from CIMC there. So um, in case there is anyone here that you've been told, that um, IPM program is $1,300. Please, that is not true. Okay, that is not true. Well, we display the, the right, we've sent the brochure severally to, 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 to everyone through emails and all of that. So I'm sure you, you didn't see $1,300 there. But in case you wish to give us $1,300 as a donation, I promise you will accept it wholeheartedly. Okay, we'll accept it wholeheartedly. Thank you so much. I needed to make that clarification because that information came about two days ago and some people were asking. So we needed to clear that, especially those from the international community. Okay. Your fee is the same as this, the same thing as what other any other country is paying. So there is no difference in country. Okay. What you're paying as a Nigerian is the same as what a Ghanaian is paying, is the same thing as what a Somalian is paying, the same thing as what a Ugandan is paying, and any other country is the same fee. There is no increase and there is no deduction. All right. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, how many of us here attended the first uh, section on um, introduction to safety in the general management class? Please, if you did, can you just um, wave your hand? Can you just raise your hand? You did the first class, you attended the first class in the general introduction class. Can you just wave your hand? Can you just wave your hand? Okay, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Okay, so for all the people that attended the uh, for all the people that attended the first class, you are welcome. So the, for the first class that we did, we are not going to repeat um, that again. So we, 
we encourage everyone to get a piece of that from the YouTube channel um, and that will help. So you can take a little time and go through it. Okay, so thank you, Mr. James, Mr. Richard, Mr. Jamil, Ms. Mr. and Mrs. Jamil. So you can go through that in the, in the YouTube channel. All right. So we are going to look at um, another um, aspect of safety where we'll do more of the definitions and create a, a better background. I, I would also like to know um, if you are a safety professional here, you're already practicing as a safety professional, please can you um, just wave your hands also, you are a practicing professional in safety or you're working in a safety department. Let me bring these hands down first. Okay, you're working in a safety department or a safety professional. Can you just um, raise your hand, just wave. You work in a safety department you work in, um, you work as a safety uh, license professional. Okay, thank you, Mr. Richard, Mr. Clement, you're welcome. Okay, is there any other person here who works in the safety department or so? All right, thank you so much. Okay. So for those of us that are already working in the safety department, most of the things here won't be new, but for some of us that, uh, coming in for the first time. Some of the things here might be new to us. They are new to us as words, but not new to us as practice because everything here are things we do on daily basis. So in the lesson objectives, um, we are going to look at, um, we are going to look at uh, the terms used in health and safety as regarding to health, safety, accident, exposure, fatality, harm, hazard, housekeeping, HSC, near means PPE, restricted work case, risk, unsafe art, unsafe condition, safe working load, as low as reasonably practicable incidents. Then we'll also look at what safety, health and safety at work means. Then we'll look at influences on health and safety. Then we'll look at the major causes of fatalities, injuries, and e-health in the workplace. We we'll also look at slip strips and falls. We we'll look at accident ratios. We we'll look at the costs and benefits of health and safety to employee and employers. Then we we'll look at the Health and Safety Work Act of 1974, the employee rights risk assessment and uh, the application and the importance. And then we we'll look at job hazard analysis or job safety analysis or job safety instruction and uh, hazard and effect management process. Then we'll look at hierarchy of um, control measures, risk control measures. We'll look at the risk assessment matrix. And uh, okay, so that's where we're, all, all of what we're going to be looking at in the introductory class. Okay, that's uh, more of what we're going to be looking at in the introductory class, all right? So let's begin and see what we have. Accidents in the workplace are almost native. Okay. Um, in December, I was with one of my cousins that worked with a manufacturing company in Lagos. And he told me that uh, his company fired him. And I was like, what happened? He said that the machine that was assigned to him caught somebody's hand. Okay, so the machine caught somebody's hand. So they fired him for not being safety conscious to, to how to manage his machine. Okay. Although the story looked like the person was absolutely responsible for what happened to him, but him being the one in charge of that equipment need to have put up some safety precautions, safety guidelines um, as to any other person that is not um, to use or any other person that will use the person, the machine that is not him or any member of his team. And there should be some procedures or some, some, some tag outs that should have uh, prevented people from working within the machine. So we have accidents happening every day uh, in the workplace because of um, lack or poor of health and safety management in the workplace. All right, so we have the domestic safety issues also. We have domestic safety issues also that um, affect um, um, the, the home or affect our, our environment. Okay, so the, some of those domestic safety issues could lead to fire outbreak. Some of those domestic safety issues could be electrical shocks. Some of those domestic safety issues 
could be on kitchen safety and um, all of that. Okay, so it's important we understand all of this, that safety is applicable in every field and facet of life. All right. Okay, so in this class, um, we are going to have different groups and the grouping will start from next week. Um, in the grouping, we are to have team leaders and we are to have uh, spoke persons. So uh, if you look at your calendar very well, you will know the date that will be due for presentation or when presentations will start. So as you are taking attendance by next week, you will be, you'll be, you'll be having your groups so you can follow from there. All right, so this issue of um, accidents happening, at, uh, things that happen daily, okay? So this could just be a picture of the hand, but uh, it might not just be a hand. Some people, it could be their whole life. It could be the whole car, it could be the whole factory, okay, uh, and all of that. So we have to pay attention. Um, I don't know how many of us know Femi Otedola. I was uh, reading one of the, um, some things about him on Forbes magazine. And I realized that he actually had passed through thick and thin to become him a billionaire or even a trillionaire. Femi Otedola is the owner of Fort Oil, or Fort, uh, Fort Energy Company. So um, I was reading about him and that um, there was a time that his whole container, his whole, his whole investment collapsed in, on the sea. His whole cabin collapsed on the sea. So according to, to him, he lost over $450 million in that particular accident, okay? That claimed everything. But well, he, thank God he was able to come back to, to, to business and uh, keep pushing. But Fort Oil had not remained the same since the incidents of that collapse. Okay, in fact, some branches of Fort Oil in some core, some other, uh, some core areas in the country like Nigeria had to stop or they sold off the, the, the facility for other organizations or to other organizations. So safety is paramount. Like I said, someone could look at this and say, it's just a finger. Tomorrow, it could be the whole hand. Next tomorrow, it could be the whole business. Next tomorrow, it could be the person's life entirely. So being careless about safety could result to major accidents that could cripple lives forever. Okay, so we have to pay attention to what safety and health management is all about um, in our organization. Okay, I'm seeing from the chat room, someone saying no audio. Please, if you can hear me loud and clear, please, can you put one one in the chat room? Let me be sure you're hearing me. If you can hear me loud and clear, please put one one in the chat room. If you can hear me loud and clear, please put one one in the chat room. All right. So uh, please, Mr. Abraham, can you please contact that person that is um, talking about audio? Let him check his device. Okay. Okay. So by, by simple definitions, let's look at what we have here. Uh, health is a state of well-being with the absence of illness or disease. Safety is the absence of risk or harm, an accident, an unplanned or undesired event uh, that can result in harm to people, property, and or um, environment. Now, these definitions are very simple, but I will not want us to be those uh, people that know so much and practically we know little. So I will try to explain, especially um, what uh, each keyword here will be centering on. When we say health in organizations, when we say health in a workplace, when we say health in an environment, some of us could actually think it's just people-oriented activities. No. When we say health in an organization, we are looking at the health of the people, we are looking at the health of the environment, we are looking at the health of the assets or equipment or resources within the facility. We are looking at the health of the organization as regards to the reputation of the organization. So health has four basic dimensions. The same way safety has four basic dimensions, safety of people, safety of environment, safety of assets, and safety of organizational reputation. So we could have a case where um, the people in an organization are healthy, but the environment of the organization is not healthy. 
We could have a situation where people and environment are healthy, but the assets are not healthy. Take for instance, um, what happened to Femi Otedola, right? So Femi had his staff in good shape, had his environment in good shape, but the facility was messed up. So that the health of the facility was gone. And that crippled the whole business that they needed to start afresh. All right, so when we say health, safety, and environment, we are not just looking at people, okay? We are not just looking at people. We are looking at the, the entire dimensions where people are involved. So there is people involvement, there is environmental safety, there is asset protection and safety, and there is reputational safety. Reputational safety uh, is always, um, uh, a case where we guide against um, some reputational crisis or reputational accidents that can affect the work that we are delivering. So let's take, for instance, in Nigeria for a case, sometimes uh, we hear things like uh, Indom is killing people, Gala is uh, killing people. And for the first time in my life, I've never seen where Indom killed people or gala killed people. And sometimes you hear also reputational crisis coming like, uh, don't eat suya. Suya has been poisoned, it's killing people. And I'm here to see one person that has been killed by suya, all right? And you hear things like they, 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 they drink they imported from so, 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 it's not killing people. I'm here to see the drink that is killing people, all right? I was in one of the meetings and we were, we were having um, breakfast, we we're having um, tea break, and they shared uh, gala as uh, the, the part of the breakfast. And one of the persons, they said, ah, gala is killing people. I said, ah, you came to a safety class. I even have mind to say gala is killing people. I said, okay, give me your gala. Let me be the one to bear the risk of your ignorance, okay? I would take care of the risk of your ignorance. I wish it was a chicken or turkey that you say is killing people. I would have appreciated that quite a lot. So when we say health, reputation is also covered as part of health because there are so many businesses crumbling. They are just under the table because of reputational crisis, the, the positioning they have had in the business place. All right. So this, their safety and their health in the business place is not well managed. Okay, it's not well managed. So the role of a safety manager does not just stop at managing people's health and safety. It goes beyond that. So there is an element of people, there is an element of environment, there is an element of asset protection, and there is an element of reputation. Okay, all right, thank you so much. Let's uh, proceed. Okay, then we'll have other terms like exposure and we'll have fatality exposure, the measurement of time during which the subject is at risk from a hazard. Um, exposure is the duration, either someone or an environment or an asset or a reputation is exposed to a certain um, hazard. Let's take for instance, those of us that work in high temperature environments, um, you work in high temperature environment. The risk of fainting is high in high temperature environment because in a high temperature environment, one of the consequences is dehydration. And as soon as the body gets dehydrated, the risk of fainting becomes high because um, as dehydration um, comes on board, um, the, uh, the accident, uh, what they call it, oxygen flow becomes less. The, 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 the uh, uh, volume of oxygen, um, in the body becomes low, which can result to fainting, right? Now, before you could actually experience fainting in a high temperature environment, they, there could have been some levels of exposure uh, that would have resulted to that. You cannot just walk into a high temperature environment. Let's say you walk into a temperature environment of 60 degrees centigrade or 70 degrees, and all of a sudden you walked in and fainted immediately. No, it doesn't work that way. All right, although 70 degrees is a little high, say 50, 60, uh, 50, 60. You don't just walk in there and faint automatically. The, the, the number of hours you stay in that environment is going to be the thing that will determine what happens. I'm going to use this as a case. I was watching a frog 
a frog that was put inside cold water and then they started boiling the water. The frog was dead. The temperature of the water kept increasing, kept increasing, kept increasing until the, the water started boiling and then killed the frog. So obviously what the body of the frog was doing that it comes to a point, it adapts, it comes to a point, it adapts, it comes to a point, it adapts, and it was destroying, the more, he, the, more the frog adapted, the more the cells were damaged. And at the point, it, there was no, no more to be, uh, no more adaptation. And that ceased the life of, um, of, the, of the frog. In the same way, let's take an example, someone that smokes, Smoking, the smokers, Federal Ministry of Health warns that smokers are liable to die young. They don't die the first day. They don't die young the first day they started smoking. All right, they don't die young. But after a prolonged exposure to smoking, it, it, it becomes a chronic, it, it has a chronic effect on the system that then develops to other health implications that can now result to loss of life. So exposure, determines the level at which um, uh, a hazard can turn to a risk, all right? Okay, then we'll now talk about fatality. Death due to work-related incident or illness regardless of the time in between, um, or time between injuries or illness and death. Fatality, death, anytime you have fatality, fatality is a death-related case, okay? Some of us, uh, say use uh, some safety words in our normal day life that does not really depict what it means. For instance, say you had a, a, a fatal motor accident. If you had a fatal motor accident and he's still living, then the, fat, the fatality was not to the person that escaped it. The fatality was now to the, the, the assets that may not be recovered again. Okay. So we need to understand the place of uh, safety terms in the everyday things we see. Okay, so death due to work-related incident or illness, regardless of the time uh, between injuries or illness and death. They will have harm, includes death, injury, physical or mental ill health, damage to property, loss of production or any combination of these that could cause harm. Then hazard, a source or situation with a potential to cause harm including uh, human injury or ill health, damage to property, damage to the environment, or a combination of this. Okay, a source or a situation with a potential. According to ISO, they will tell you any source or situation that has a potential to cause harm. If not controlled, if not controlled. So uh, it can cause harm. At the same time, it can be useful of course, hazards are useful, right? Hazards are the things we basically use every day. In fact, I, I used to make this as a humorous statement that what makes our life beautiful is dependent on the number of hazards associated to us and how we're able to manage those hazards so, so that they don't turn to accidents or uh, bring about negative risks that will not impact us neg uh, negatively. All right, so if you talk about your car, your car is a hazard. The risk of your car is that Someday somebody could enter the car, have accident, and die. So the hazard has become uh, sorry, the car has become a hazard that can result to death. The food we eat is a hazard. When you take abnormal quantities of food, that's when you know that you've entered into a risk zone. Okay. The clothes we wear, they are hazards. You can use the same clothes to strangle someone. The seats we sit on, they are hazards. If if on the, in the process of sitting on the seat, the seat gets to break and you get to land your bomb bomb on the broken part and it pierces your bomb bomb. That's the negative side of the hazard. So we are all surrounded by hazard. Hazards are all of what we see in our workplace. Hazards are all of what we see in our environment. They are all of what we see in, in, in our homes. They are all of what we see as we are walking on the road. So hazard is just everywhere. Hazard is just everywhere. But what makes um, the difference in, in the beauty of hazard is how we now manage hazard. Yes, they have the ability to cause harm, but if we control those hazards, they won't be able to cause harm, all right?
Okay. Um, someone is still saying not hearing uh, audio, um, not no audio. Please, I'll recommend that the person checks um, his uh, device and be sure that uh, he's following. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Then we have HSSE, which is Health, Safety, Security, and Environment. Security is an important part of um, HSE. All right. Then we have NIAMIS. NIAMIS is an event where no contact or exchange of energy or code and thus did not result in personal injury, asset loss, or damage to the environment. So a near miss is um, an incident that has the capacity to cause harm but did not cause harm. All right. Um, and we have such happening quite every day. All right. So um, you had a sleep and you did not fall. That's a near miss. It could have resulted to a fall, but you did not fall. That's a near miss. Um, maybe an accident could have happened, but it did not happen. That's a near miss. There's something about near miss. When people have near misses, they tend to be care uh, free about it. They you you see them laugh about it and be like, oh, I would have just been hit, but I was not hit. But they don't pay attention to the safety precautions that will stop the repeat of the occurrence of those near misses. So essentially, in organizations, it is the lack of uh, reporting of near misses that results to frequent um incidences that now result to the risk themselves occurring or the hazards themselves turning to um, negative effects all right so paying attention to um, near misses is very very important paying attention to near misses is very very important and documenting near misses is very very important in some organizations in fact in safety practice not reporting a near miss is equivalent to committing murder not reporting a near miss, you can go to jail for not reporting a near miss. So reporting near misses is crucial. Reporting near misses is crucial to safety management. No matter how little it is, report every case of near miss, report every case of safety to the appropriate um, bodies within your organization and let them follow up on that. It is very, very important, all right? Then we have what we call the restricted work case. Restricted work case, a work-related injury or illness that renders the injured person unable to perform all normally assigned work functions during a scheduled work shift or being assigned to another job on a temporary or permanent basis on the day following the injury. Okay, so in a restricted work case, we have a, a case where maybe someone, um, um, let's take for instance, production manager, uh, with production assistant. So a production manager gets to have an injury that takes him off the production plant temporarily. That is called a restricted work case. In that case, the assistant production manager will take over pending when the production manager will return. In a case where the injury becomes um, a medical treatment case, then the person will have to go to uh, receive medical treatment for that. And uh, if the person needs to be reassigned to another job pending when he's well enough to resume his uh, default job, that can also be done. So in restricted work case, um, there is no loss of um, time, um, but there is an injury. Compared to lost time injury where there is loss of time due to an injury. Okay, so where there is lost time injury, it could be an indication that there was no replacement for that particular um, office holder that had an incident. Okay, all right. So when you're making safety reports, you're reporting on hazards, you're reporting on risks, you're reporting on, um, on um, lost time injuries, you're reporting on restricted work cases, um, both the ones that are medical treatment cases, uh, those ones that have um, uh, partial uh, disabilities, those that have permanent total disabilities, you're reporting on all of them, okay? Because all of those things have sources where they are coming from. And if those sources are managed, they can reduce, drastically reduce the occurrences of those incidents from coming on board, all right? They will have incident, which can be accident or near me. So an incident is an unwanted occurrence capable of causing or has caused occupational illness, injury or death to persons 
property damage, environmental damage, or loss or reputation of the company. So an incident can be an accident which has already caused um, a damage, or it can be a near miss which has the capacity to cause a damage. So while you are also doing your safety reporting, you're reporting on incidences. If there were accidents, you report on accidents. If there were near misses, you report on near misses. All right. Now, one of the one of the reasons why we must report near misses is that in an, in an accident case, the, the event has already told you or show you the capacity to which it can it can it can happen, the, the kind of injuries it can occur and claims it can make. But a near miss is just potential. So it could be more dangerous, the effects could be more dangerous than the accident. So to prevent it from resulting to accident, it's better we we'll stop it from occurring. So we must put this the, the, the we must put um, safety standards and safety policies and regulations in place to ensure that we have a very good um, health and safe, healthy and safe uh, environment that we are working in. Now have risk. Risk is a measure of the likelihood that the harm from a particular hazard will occur, taking into account the possible severity of the harm. So risk most often is not what we call it. Some of us refer to danger as risk. Uh, Coming to this class is a risk, but it's not a danger. Okay, coming to this class is a risk. What is the risk? The risk of coming to sit here for three hours to listen to a class, which might impact on your health. The risk of um, maybe hearing what you don't want to hear. Uh, possibly, that's if the facilitator choose to say what is not part of the schedule or part of the content. So you have risk, but risks are not dangerous. A risk is a measure of the likelihood of an, uh, an event or a harm occurring. So it's not a certainty. It's a possibility that, oh, this might happen. Uh, it's a possibility. Coming to class to stay for trial is a possibility, all right? Coming to class to hear what Oh, might not be of interest to you. It's a possibility. It's not an assurance that it will happen. Okay, it's not an assurance that it will happen. Now, um, uh, riding a car is the the risk of accident. Is of your a car having an accident is a risk. Is not an assurance. Okay, is not an assurance. So we we have to differentiate between risks and hazards. Some people also. Um, try to combine risks and hazards together. Okay, they are not the same thing. They have similarities, but they are not the same thing. Now we have unsafe conditions and unsafe art. Any art or condition that deviates from a generally recognized safe way or specified method of doing a job and increases the potential for accident is called an unsafe art and or unsafe condition, right? any art or condition that deviates from generally recognized safe way or specified method of doing a job and increases the potential for an incident is called unsafe art and unsafe condition. I'm going to ask a question and I will need to know whether I'm the only one that I've had this experience. Um, in my early days, I worked with a company, a food, a multinational food company. I've always shared this in my class. Now, this food company, they, they are, men looking around, you will find out that they observe safety, um, safety standards, but on compliance basis, not on performance basis. How do I mean? You will see, you will get to have an, um, your safety boots, your safety, um, safety kits and all of that, but the enforcement to wear those things was not there. The enforcement to use the safety tools, we are not there. So apparently they were just doing it to comply with the laws governing safety in the country, all right? Now, in those days, someone could actually come to work and go to the restroom, change, or go to, is it restroom now we'll call it, go change, 
still wear the clothes he came to work with, not wearing his safety, safety boots, not wearing his safety uh, clothes, and he comes to production room, okay? I personally, I had such, such experiences because then I was not, I, I didn't know what safety was. So we were all like, um, just do, is the most important thing is not to do the work. That's what some of us believe, which was wrong. Now, if you ever had such an experience where at, there was a time that in your workplace, safety didn't really matter to you, or you've worked in an environment where if they tell you, put on your safety boot, you'd be like, it's too heavy. Put on your safety uh, jacket, ah, it will make me feel heat. If you ever had such an experience, can you type one one in the chat room? If you ever had such an experience where you safety wasn't really your concern, all you needed was to get money, get uh, the work done, and just go. Okay, all right. So at least I have one person, two persons that we had three, four. So I'm not the only one that ever had that such. Okay, so I, I asked this question the other day. And I'm going to ask the same question again because this one I asked now was like an industry-based question. Now, let me ask an everyday question, everyday question, everyday question. Some of us will repent after this class because we are the man is the primary enforcer of all natural disaster. For instance, we are the primary motivators of flood based on the activities we do. Although there are some that are not motivated by man anyway, but over 80% of the activities that are being done that generate natural disaster, they are all caused by man. Okay, a flood, a cause, the, the effects of mass activities on the earth result to flood. The effects of mass activities on the earth result to, uh, in some places, landslide. Okay, uh, collapse of eight, eight wars and all of that. Okay, and earthquakes and all of that. Okay, so I'm going to ask this question. Please, let's be objective. Let's be sincere to ourselves. Who among us here had ever drank a bottle of water or a sachet of water and you were not careful as how to dispose that? You just discarded it anyhow. We don't know your name. Don't worry. Nobody will query you after this. Uh, if you've ever done that before, just type zero zero in the chat room. You've ever done that. Um, you just drank water. You threw it out from a voice, maybe from the car, or maybe yours was banana peels or granite um, shells that you just finished eating. You threw, you just threw it out. You you, you, you didn't bother about uh, where should it be kept and all of that. Okay, so we have these issues coming up. So, how many of us know? How many of us know? How many of us know? If you know, just type zero one that. Those things, those waste we are disposing to the environment, they have negative effect on the health of those people that are disposing it directly or indirectly. How many of us know that those waste we dispose that seem as though they don't really mean anything to us? They actually have a reverse effect on us. If you ever know, please type one one in the chat room. Okay, so some people know. Okay, some people know that those things we do have an effect. Please. Not where I'm going to. I'm going to unsafe art and unsafe condition. So unsafe art in a way create unsafe, uh, could create unsafe conditions. Okay. And let's be a little more realistic. How many of us this week, this week now, this week that is ending today, this week, you have drank a sachet water and disposed it without wonder, uh, without bothering what uh, the implication was, I'm talking of this week, you've done some, some unsafe acts as regards to environmental safety that you were not careful about, maybe disposal of waste, uh, sachet ladders, your bottle water, uh, you didn't really care about how they were going to be managed, or maybe you just drank it and kept it on top of the table, you didn't care about how the cleaner was going to, to dispose that. If you've ever had such an experience um, uh, this week, Please type 02 in the chat room. This week, I'm not talking of last week, this week. Or perhaps you just finished your, your stick of cigar. You didn't bother to check whether the light went off. You just threw it off. All right, so, um, oh, so somebody did it this morning. Your sins are forgiven, Shola. Your sins are forgiven. Ah, somebody did it 20 minutes ago. 
Your sin is very fresh. It's forgiven. Your sin is forgiven. So for all of us that have been doing all of that, our sins are forgiven. Now somebody asked the question, how does this affect the environment? How does it affect us? That's a very beautiful question. Now, before I answer that question, is there any person here that would like to say, maybe anybody in environment and health, you study environment or you practice environment and health. Eh? Is there anybody here who can say how, say how these operations of man, how this unsafe act of man can result to uh, pollution, result to negative side effects on us and all of that? Please, if you wish to say, um, in the next one minute, just raise your hand and the speaker will unmute you. All right, please, Mr. Abraham, kindly unmute uh, Mr. Emmanuel or Ladej. All right, Mr. Abraham, you please, you can, um, uh, Mr. Oladej, Good morning, everyone. Please, you can kindly. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, everyone. Yeah, good morning, okay. Um, Mr. Emmanuel, your, your line is not too clear. I'm not hearing you. Good morning, everyone. Can All I, right, please. Can I, yes, yes. Go ahead, please. Uh -huh. Thank you for this question. However, before I answer, it's like um, we that did the last uh, section uh, HSC program. It's mm -hmm. like um, you cheated us in one way or the other. This uh -huh. definition of term you gave to us, in fact, I'm overwhelmed. God bless you for the new and uh, development. Then on the second question, in fact, in my area, whenever there is flood, I used to tell them that we are the cause of the problem. You will see them littering the gutter at night with dirt, throwing things here and there. In fact, I'm, I'm even bothered. To the extent I'm looking for a way to go and report them to the local government in my area. I have mm -hmm. not been able to do that. So what we do every day, has really be having effect in my area. I live in Okota area. And we used to, when the two rain falls like this, there is always flood. So that is my own contribution. Thank you, sir. All right, thank you so much, Mr. Emmanuel. We've, we didn't change the we didn't change the class manual. All right, please, Mr. Abraham, can we unmute uh, Muhammad? Please, Muhammad, can you? Uh, Muhammad can you? Okay, he doesn't have an audio. audio. Okay. Yes. Please, Muhammad, you need to check your audio so that it can come on. Thank you so much. All right. So, from the little that uh, Mr. Emmanuel has said, we can we can also relate to all of this in our own uh, personal environment. Okay. And how does this? I don't want to be much more technical. But how does this affect your health? How does this affect your health? Um, by default, everyone here did biology, whether you like it or not. In Nigeria, uh, I may not say about other countries, but if you're a Nigerian, uh, we, are, we, are, uh, we are mandated to do biology. And in biology, there's what we call ecosystem. And the ecosystem, we have... Um, we have the relationship that exists between man and other things, all right? So in the ecosystem, let's bring it a little down. The ecosystem is actually managed or by different players. So we have microorganisms and we have macroorganisms. The microorganisms, to a great extent, have a major role to play in the degradation of waste and management of air. They have a major role to play in air quality management. So when we keep throwing away such letters, keep dis discarding words that are non-biodegradable, we are also giving a whole lot of work to those microorganisms, okay? Which we, at the end of the day, reduce their potency to work. And which at the end of the day, we affect the production of plants or uh, what do you call it? Cultivation of plants and uh, or agricultural work. Let me let me use that generic word. Uh, it will affect agriculture and the agriculture will affect output of resources, which will affect us. Now, the degradation of 
the biodegradation of those words that are degradable by organisms, you would see foul odors or you, per you perceive foul odors. Okay, you perceive foul odors, which can also cause air pollution and that will affect our health also. Okay, then is it to talk about the flooding? Is it to talk about the, 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 un the uncommon activity of man, especially in blockage of uh, gutters, waterways? Okay, it's just common to most people. If, in fact, there, there could be some people in this class that the best time they dispose waste is when it's raining. Then they go to the gutter and dump it there. In fact, if you've ever done such, uh, if you've ever done such a thing before, please can you put one one in the chat room? If you've ever done such a thing before, can you put one one in the chat room that you you use you you dispose your waste during um, during um, rainy rainy time or you've seen people that do that just put one one in the chat room all right uh, so we have some hands still raised up i think uh, Mohammed now Okay, so we have some hands up. Okay, you can go ahead and unmute them. Let's hear from them. Okay. Uh, Mohammed, please, you can unmute yourself. Mohammed, please unmute your mic and speak up. Okay. All right. Oh, 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 is my name. Okay. okay. Good morning. Oh, All right. Please, please go on. Yes, my own contribution towards it is, I'm an environmental health officer here in Port Harcourt. Okay. So when you dispose waste abnormally, for instance, the sachet uh, uh, water or the plastic one. One, it causes, it defies the aesthetic nature of the city. What do I mean by that? The environment has to feed its nature by the greener pasture, the natural greener pasture. So that whenever you are, for instance, when you are out and you see a, a sachet water, bottle waters, it don't feed the environment. By the time you come out, and you see that those things are not there. It's only the plants. You feed the nature. Mm -hmm. And another one is that it, it, it causes home accident. Even this morning, it happened to me. Oh, I was yeah. just facing waters. I was just entering the passage. I don't know that there was a telephone uh, bag on the ground. As I just dropped the water, I dro my leg just slipped because it was on that telephone bag. And it was that telephone bag contains some waste and they're all such it. Mm -hmm. waterproof so i feel i fell down instantly free sure, if not that there was something be, beside me so i now had my hand if not i don't even know where i would have been by now so those okay. things are not good it's very very bad it causes accident and it defaces the aesthetic nature and it also causes flood most especially it contributes to flood because some they will say government is no government is working it's just that we the individual we are not helping the government who are the government so people forget that we are part of the government uh, it's the work of the government to clean the uh, drainage is work how can it be the work of the government have provided drainage for you now your own work is to make sure that waste don't enter especially these telephone bags don't enter because they will go and block the entrance and when they are feed inside there they takes a longer time to decay to decompose. So it will stay there and there will be no way for water to go out. So the whole place will be flooded. That is just my own contribution. All right, thank you so much. So we are hearing from the person that it has happened to this morning. Yes. All right, thank you, thank, you, thank you so much for that. Okay, so the, the unsafe acts and unsafe conditions could actually result to massive accidents. And if, if care is not taken, they could result to death. So we must pay attention to, to the kind of um, 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 attitudes we put up as to creating an, a safe 
and um, healthy workplace, all right? It's very, very important, it's very, very important. Okay, so is there any other hand up? The Mohammed is still up. Mohammed, um, I think maybe your network could be an issue or something. I don't really- uh, Mohammed, you can unmute your- Mohammed, you can unmute your mic. Maybe he has uh, network issues or something. Okay, I suspect so. Okay, so um, I, I will just proceed then. <clears throat> then we have man hours, man hours, total number of hours worked by workers in a workplace over a period of time. Please, if you can still see my screen, um, please kindly let me know. Um, I'm now on SWL and Alap. Please, if you can see SWL and uh, Alap, kindly help me type one one in the chat room. If you can see that, help me type one one in the chat room. Um, let me be sure we are all together. All right, thank you. So safe working load, what is safe working load? Safe working load has to do with for each, for each um, machine, for each human being, there is a capacity due for such a person. In, in occupational safety, which will be dealt with today, I think that will be the last class for today. That will be done by one of, one of our best facilitators in this health and safety matter. You don't give a baby of five years a load of 50 kg to carry. I don't think that is possible. No matter how undesigned someone could be, there are things that common sense should teach us to do. Now, in the workplace, there are some things that we do that are wonderful. The capacity of your machine could be maybe 200 uh, tons per day. And then all of a sudden, you're forcing the machine to produce 500 tons per day. And you still want the machine to stay 10 years before you work it. That is not, it's not possible. It's not possible. You have a, a let's take for instance, some of us that do training. So maybe your training facility is uh, 50 persons. And then you now went and registered 100 persons. And now you're squeezing the class. Everybody, irrespective of the AC, everybody just sweating. That is a non-safe working load. You are, you are, you are overloading the, the facility. And we'll also see that with people that do electrical work and engineering work. So you see, a work, maybe a casting that should have required uh, um, a certain diameter of rod. You now choose to bring it down, bring the requirement down, maybe use a smaller diameter of rod for a higher load. Very soon that house will crack. Not only crack, it will fall. If you check most of the issues of um, house collapse and all of that, it's just a function of unsafe working load. You carrying what is more than a particular um, facility or machine or individual and giving upon him, okay? And in some of our organizations, yes, we also do that. One person, only one person is customer service rep, is human resource manager, he's security, he's, uh, which other one now? He's a uh, secretary, he's uh, everything and you want him to perform. No, 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 it doesn't work that way. So in self-working load, we'll make the right prescription of effort or right prescription of jobs or work to be done by a particular machinery or human or facility or what have you. Self-working load guarantees effective and efficient performance. And we also have some wonderful people that their self-working load, Sorry, this is a little digression, right? You know, I said one of the risks of attending this class could be that you will hear what you don't want to hear, but just a little digression. There are some people that when it comes to domestic work, they know what to tell their children to do. That if the children want to do more, that they say, no, 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 you can't do that. But they have a maid that is of less age than their children that the maid will do 10 times of the one they say their children should not do. That is on safe working load you're prescribing. So that's why you see the maid today. He, he never looks, the maid never looks nice. 
he, all, he or she always look older than her age or older than his age. Because why there is unsafe working load for that particular uh, uh, child. So we need to be careful, all right? We need to be careful on that. They will have a lap as low as reasonably practicable. It refers to a process of reducing likelihood of occurrence of an incident or the minimization of the effects or consequences of such incidents. So you, you are working on reducing the likelihood of an occurrence of an incident, perhaps an incident that will produce a negative risk or negative effect. You're working on reducing it as, as low as every practicable. So um, someone in this class could be applying a lab. How do I mean? Someone could say, oh, before I pay, let me even see the content. Let me even hear the people lecturing. Let me even, so that way, in a, in a way, reduce your risk. So before you make your payment, you would have reduce your risk practical, practically. Some people may even say, okay, let me even write to uh, C CIMC to know whether they are really, these people, whether this money I'm going to pay, whether the certificate will really come from this place. Or someone says, okay, let me even write to SHRM and find out if this certificate has any, or this organization has anything to do with them. Are they really accredited and all of that? That is part of the ALAP, all right? Reducing your risk to as low as reasonably practicable or reducing the consequences or effect of a risk to as low as reasonable practicable, all right? We do it in our procurement. We do it in our relationships. We do it in our um, employee management. We do it virtually in everything. We practice a lab, okay? We practice a lab. All right, then the next thing we'll look at there is the personal protective equipment or what we call the PPEs. All equipment and clothing intending to be utilized, which affords protection against one or more risks to health and safety. This includes protection against adverse weather conditions. This includes protection against um, adverse weather conditions. So some of the uh, PPEs will have, will have the hard hat, will have the safety glasses, will have the ear protection, the full body harness, um, will have safety gloves, will have back belt, will have safety lanyard, with uh, safety hooks, we have um, steel toed shoes and boots. They will also have face shield, face mask, um, um, lifeline and all of that. Now, importantly, I would like to say this to everyone here. Please don't be like me those days I used to work and be like the PPE doesn't matter, okay? If you are working in this area, please make sure that you put on your PPEs. Of course, identify the right PPEs to be used and make sure that number one, you being the safety manager or safety officer or safety supervisor or safety director, make sure you are always the role model that you want your team to follow. That is very, very important. And never you use PPEs for granted. No, don't ever say to yourself, it doesn't matter, nothing will happen. Someday something will happen and there'll be no PPE to, to help, okay? Uh, someone was sharing in, in one of my safety classes of how they lost a contract with a particular company. And um, he was working with a, an oil company. They do easy supply, something like that. So they, they are among the people, uh, their company is one of those uh, that do um, importation of oil and gas and all of that. So he said they were to have um, a contract with um, Greece, a particular company in Greece, or they met in the ocean, their cabin versus the cabin of those ones. Now, the person from their cabin left the cabin with just slippers to go and meet the, the Greece people in their own cabin. And said when they saw him, they told him to stay. And that was the end of it. Just turn back and go. Okay, turn back and do what? And go. So wearing PPEs is very, very important to our jobs. Wearing PPEs, identifying the right PPE and then putting it on at the right time is very, very important. It saves life. Okay, so I have different PPEs in different organizations. So you see those for the, those, those of them in the pharmaceutical, you see those of them, maybe astronaut, and then you see those in the welding, uh, woodwork, different PPEs. When you get to the bank, there is also a separate PPE 
for the bank. You get to food industry. They have their own PPEs and all of that. Okay. All right. Health and safety is all about preventing accidents and injuries, ensuring well-being of workers, whether they are full-time, part-time, temporary, and self-employed, and well-being of visitors, whether members of the public or members of the internal house, contractors, and customers. The physical environment, behavior of the people, competence, and safe working practices. Look at this. Safety, health and safety is about the physical environment one, behavior of the people, the competencies of the people, and then safe working practices of those people. They are the things that will determine how, um, how safe a work environment is. And I, I, sometimes I get to find it um, hard to believe. Some of us, when we get to the office, we are, we, we are very safety conscious. When we get out of the office, safety evaporates from our body. The same person that will drink water and go and drop it in the waste bin in the office, drinks water as he's going home and throws it off the glass. So you'll be wondering what's happening. Is it that uh, there is a spirit within the office that enforces you to become safety compliant in the office and then makes you safety deviant uh, or safety non-compliant outside of the office? Okay, some of us are very safety conscious in the workplace. When we get home, is another thing entirely. Some are very conscious at home. When we get to office, is another thing entirely. So those competencies, those behaviors, must be well modeled. Safety, uh, safety behavior is, I think, when we get to level three, when we get to level three, we'll look at safety um, behavior modeling. There must be a thorough way of modeling our behaviors to be safety conscious, irrespective of where we are. Okay, irrespective of where we are. That is very, very important. Okay, influences on health and safety. We have uh, influences resulting from occupational factors as the type of work. They will have environmental factors as the conditions with uh, the conditions of the environment. And we also have human factors as behavior and attitude that can affect health and safety programs in the organization. With respect to occupational factors, the type of work we do determine the type of safety inclusions we have in the workplace. Is there anybody here that works in a biotech environment? You work in a biotech environment. If you work in a biotech environment, please, can you just um, raise your hand, just wave. If you work in a biotech environment where you do biogenetics and all of that, you can just uh, wave and let's see you. Okay, so no one is working in a bio environment here. Okay, now, someone shared an experience in my class. Uh, Okay, I'm seeing a hand up, Kazim Ibrahim. Kazim Ibrahim, where do you work? Oh, the audio is not on. Okay. I would have loved to know where you work. Just tell us where you work in the chat room. Now, this young man was sharing a story or a case of um, what is happening to our sister. Who works uh, in a biotech lab? In a biotech lab. Now, before she got that job, she gave birth to her first son, who was very handsome and cute. Then in the, in the veg of her resumption of work, so she got pregnant and the, the first child she delivered while working in that biotech, biotech lab had some um, moronic signs. You, you get what I mean? Like imbecile. And then the second one she gave birth to, still in that bio, while working in that biotech lab, had the same effect. And she was pregnant for the third one. And I told the young man, I said, is it that your sister doesn't know that her environment has an effect on her health? It, it, it could result, I don't, I don't specifically know what they are doing there, but if what they are doing, I think that has to do with genetic uh, re-engineering and all of that. It also has a way of re-engineering her own body to, to, to change what is happening to what she has inside. So the type of occupation we do has a way of affecting uh, our health and safety. So the kind of health uh, safety policies, safety inclusions, uh, procedures and standards that need to be raised will be based on the type of work or the, the occupational factors inherent to 
the organization. They will have environmental factors. I just gave an instance today of high temperature environments and how they can also affect um, our work environment, uh, affect us and our work environment. So if you're working in an environment where there's high pressure, high temperature, high uh, light intensity and all of that, there should be well um, detailed uh, uh, safety inclusions to manage those things because all of those things have their own side effects. Let's take, for instance, a banker that is always looking at the computer from 8 a.m. to possibly 5 uh, p.m. Uh, he or she might think it doesn't have an effect, but very soon those things has will have an effect on their head. They, they will often have headache and then with with, with time, they start having eye defects, okay? So those, those environmental conditions also need to be well managed. They will have the human factors, like behaviors and attitudes, okay? I just spoke about that in a, in a while. The behaviors and attitudes actually are the primary drivers of safety, okay? No one can be more safe uh, than his attitude and behavior towards it. You cannot be more safe than your attitude and behavior towards it. So if we have the right safety attitudes and behavior, we have the right safety. If we have poor attitudes towards health and safety practices, then we also have to face the consequences that come alongside with them. Okay. All right, so I have the top, um, whether it was 2009 or 2020, these are the top related um, 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 fatalities that we see in the workplace. We have falls from height, struck by flying, uh, falling or flying object, struck by transport or vehicles. And um, as of 2008, 2009, this was a recorded um, case. Then we have um, slip streets and falls, manual handling cases, struck by falling or flying object. These also are major accidents or sources of accidents or sources of injuries to the workplace. And then As of 2008, 2009, over a, um, a three-day injury period that was analysis that was done, this was the record, about 105,222 uh, 1, injuries being recorded, just over a three-day period analysis, okay? Then top three work-related ill health. We have stress, musculoskeletal disorders, and uh, skin disease, okay? And all of these, as of 2008, 2009, resulted to about 24.6 million days lost due to ill health. So the ill health were caused by stress, caused by musculoskeletal disorders, caused by diseases. Now, let's quickly look at some of these uh, hazards uh, um, at the workplace. We have sleep strips and falls. But before we continue, can we just take a one minute break? and then we'll be back. and welcome back. So let's look at sleep strips and falls. Please ensure to sign your attendance before you leave the class. The attendance will be shared by 11.30. So ensure to share your, uh, to take your attendance before you leave the class, all right? So what's a sleep, what's a trip, and what's a fall? These are the three major uh, causes of accident in a workplace, all right? A sleep, a term used to describe where the surface of a footwear or sole of a foot loose grip. Um, 
Mm -hmm. What's happening? Sorry, I clicked something wrong. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, I clicked something um, wrong. Okay. Okay, a slip is a term used to describe um, where the surface of a footwear or sole of a foot lose grip with the floor surface. It can result to a fall. It can result to a floor, fall. And slip most often result to a backward fall. More often slips result to a backward fall. Now, um, a trip is a situation where an obstruction or even surface causes the foot or leg to catch the obstruction, making a person to lose balance. And a trip can also result to a fall. Um, the trip can result to a forward fall. A trip can result to a forward fall. A trip can result to a forward fall, all right? Um, slip can result to backward fall. Trip can result to a forward fall, all right? Okay. Then what then is a fall? A fall results where a slip or a trip causes a person who was upright, walking or running to fall to the ground or floor surface. Now, what are the causes of slip trips and fall? We have wet floor, poor lightning, uh, trailing cables and wires, uh, or naval floors, using um, chairs instead of step ladders or proper footstools, then obstructions, on the floor or walkway, people's behavior is that Hello, Mr. Panito, are you, are you there? Yes, I'm here, please. Uh, the network logged me off in the white, sorry. Okay. Okay. okay, so how does um, sleep, trip, and fall have to become the major sources of accidents in the workplace, or even at home, or even by the road? Um, the, the speaker that spoke today gave her experience of how she she tripped over a, a pack of um, leather that she nearly fall. Okay, I'm going to use just a small case to draft this home so that you understand. Sometimes ago when I was uh, still in the university, um, I happened to be the class rep of my class. So I used to be the one to get lecturers to come and um, take their classes and all of that. So this particular year, I think that was our fourth year in the university, uh, this particular lecturer, uh, this, the, the semester was going, was almost gone and he was nowhere to be found. So I went to the HOD's office to make a proper report that uh, this particular prof has not come to class. Or we don't know whether he's in the country. And the HOD was like, yes, he's in the country, but he had a domestic accident. So I was wondering what was domestic accident. So uh, and my HOD then was a white man. So I I didn't know how to start asking. Is it that he 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 used his car to run over the house or something? Because somehow somehow natively anytime we hear accident is always towards car running into something or something mobile running into something. That's that's uh, the default definition of what accident uh, uh, brings to our mind whenever we hear accident. So uh, I came to my class and then I told them that Professor so, 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 so had a domestic accident. And all of us were like, hey, what happened to him? We didn't even know what domestic accident was all about. So everybody was going to his house, was going to go to his house with the mindset that, ah, maybe the, the door is off or the, the fence is off. Or we, just, we should just see one damage that really happens or that happened. So I organized my class. We went to see the prof in his house. On getting to his house, we saw prof with walking stick. 
So, after a while, when I asked Prof, say, Prof, what happened? Just listen to the story. This is where the story begins. Prof said he went to take his bath. And after taking his bath, he wanted to come out of the water bath. And his leg slipped off. And he landed with his rib cage by the edge of the water bath. And that deformed his rib cage. So they bounded him all around. And I was just imagining, is this the domestic accident? Yes, sleeps can have such disastrous effect. You can sleep and it is not the sleep that is the problem, it's what the effect of the sleep will be. Where the sleep will take you to, where the trip will take you to, where the fall will take you to. Okay, in most organizations, most people that have their hands caught, it's just a function of sleep. They slipped and landed where the machine that they were landing on was sharp enough or was in operation to cut off the hand. Okay, so sleep, trip, and falls are major accidents in the workplace. They are major accidents at home. They are major. We see we see that with our children, uh, they run, fall, and all of that. So there are major accidents that we need to pay attention to. All right, we've already highlighted all the causes. Um, it's for us to identify these causes as potential hazards and then be able to manage them effectively. So if you see wet floor, clean it up. You see poor lightning, get it done. You see trailing cables and wires, please fix it rightly. You see uneven floors, please do the right thing. Um, you see. Um, Obstruction on the walkway using chairs instead of uh, step ladders to, to do some elevated walks. Those things need to be carefully managed and then having the right safety behavior is also very, very important. So there have been some uh, research on accident ratios. Um, according to the research of Henrik in 1959, he said there is always one major accident in a sequence, the, the ratio of one major accident is to 29 minor injuries and 300 non-injury events. So it's one to 29 to 300. And this sequence has not really changed much. Okay, this sequence has not really changed much according to Henrik. Now in 1966, Baird did their own research. So they said for one serious injury, there is always 10 minor injuries following it. And then there are 30 property uh, damage accident following it, and then 600 incidents that could have had consequences. So theirs is one is to 10, is to 30, is to 600. Henrik is one is to 29, is to 300. Okay. All right. Now, what are the consequences of poor standards of health and safety in the workplace? What are the consequences of poor health and safety in the workplace? So we have accidents, injuries, fatalities, diseases, and suffering, increased absences, poor morale, and high staff turnover, legal costs and fines, insurance costs, loss of reputation. Now, all of these things are going to affect the people going to affect the environment, going to affect the asset of the organization and going to affect the reputation of the organization, all right? The risk of not having safety is more than the cost of having safety. The risk of not keeping safety in place in your organization is more than the cost of keeping safety in place. So it's wisdom for us to do the right safety practices in our workplace. So there could also be consequences of prohibition and closure by regulatory agencies, all right? A report that was uh, from UK um, trying to bring up the cost of uh, poor health and safety in UK in overall, 
there was a budget of, uh, or perhaps a contingency of 30 million pounds per year to take care of 10 million injuries, uh, uh, to take care of injuries at 10 million pounds per year and ill health at over 20 million pounds per year. So if a country is spending 30 million pounds per year on injuries, that's a whole lot that could have contributed well to the economy. Although someone could say, <laughs> this is also part of the uh, economy as there are doctors and nurses and safety experts that will be benefiting from this. All right, but it is better off if we don't get to have these injuries and uh, deaths coming to our way. Now, what are the benefits of um, good health and safety to employees? There is motivation to work, there is confidence at work, there is better health, there is lesser risk of accident, and there is less absenteeism. There is motivation to work, there is confidence at work, there is better health, there is lesser risk of accident, and there is less absenteeism. All of these are, and more, are the uh, importance of good health and safety to employees. Now, to employers, there is increased productivity, there is increased profit, happier and uh, better motivated workforce, less time taking off work, fewer problems with um, health and uh, safety inspectors. Then there is also lower insurance premiums. Then health and safety work out of 1974, what did it say? The Health and Safety Act is not just a country, one country act is a global act. And what did it say? Employers should prevent harm to, to a workers and others so far as reasonably practicable. Then there is health and safety is a shared responsibility. So this attitude of government need to do this, government need to do that, it is management responsibility, it is my ogre, it is my madam, no. It is a shared responsibility. Then self-employed people have a legal duty not to put others at risk by the way in which they work. All right, so what are employee rights? Right to safe and healthy workplace. So for all employees, for all employers, these are the things you need to make available to your employees. Right to safe and healthy workplace. Right to have questions regarding safety and health addressed. Right to receive and have access to all information regarding workplace hazards. Right to refuse to perform an unsafe act. All of these are the rights of an employee. Okay, before we go to safety tools, um, I would like to know if there are questions, if there, is, if there is any question for me on the little introduction we've done, before we go to the safety tools, talking about JHA or JSA or JSI and hazard and effect management process alongside our risk assessment. I would like to know if there is any question, if there is any comment, um, I would like to have them now and then uh, we'll proceed. If there is any question based on what we've done so far, please feel free to ask. If there is any comment, please feel free to make right now. And if you want me to proceed, please type in the in the chat room proceed. If you want me to just proceed, please you can type in the chat room proceed. If you want me to proceed, uh, just type proceed. Okay, so I'm seeing a question. What is unsafe art? Unsafe art is a deviation. Any art, any behavior, any attitude they are deviates from the standard uh, rules and regulations governing a way an operation should be carried out. That's an unsafe act. So when they say do not smoke and you go and smoke, that's an unsafe act. Do not run and you go and run, that's an unsafe act. Um, do not walk on the um, highways and you're walking on the highways, that's an unsafe act. Use the overhead bridge and you're using the underground bridge, that's an unsafe act. So an unsafe act is any um, act, attitude or behavior that deviates from the standard um, way of carrying out an operation. Mr. Courage, I think you get that now. All right, job hazard analysis. Job hazard analysis 
we are going to keep looking at job hazard analysis till we get to level three. Even after level three, we'll still be using job hazard analysis. We'll still be talking about job hazard analysis. All right, we'll still be talking about, so we are just going to create a foundation here. And then as we go to level two, we talk about job hazard analysis again. We'll go to level three. We still talk about job hazard analysis again. All right. So job hazard analysis focuses on the job task as a technique for identifying hazards associated with the job before they lead to accidents. Please read that very carefully with me. Job hazard analysis or JHA focuses on the job tasks as a technique for identifying hazards associated with the job before they lead to an accident. Now, um, if there is something I would like you to get today before you go, it's actually how to conduct a safety audit uh, or safety assessment with a JHA. So I'm going to teach us that in a moment, okay? And I will need you to have your big and your paper by your side because you're going to write them down, all right? You're going to write them down and also you're going to create your form. You're going to create your JHA form that you can use in your workplace for safety auditing. And it's not just for your personal use, you can, you can get your staff also to be well aware of what they are all about and then help them in, in that, okay? Okay, so a job safety analysis or job hazard analysis breaks down a task into individual actions or steps. So each step is then analyzed to identify how a person could be injured or the asset damage. Prevention measures are then identified to eliminate or control. The other. So in essence, the second statement has already given us uh, the breakdown of how job hazard analysis is going to be. So let's write this down. What are the steps in job hazard analysis? What are the steps? Please, these are practical steps and I will need us to pay attention to them. What are the steps in job hazard analysis? What are the steps in job hazard analysis? What are the steps in job hazard analysis? Are you there? If you have your beacon paper ready, please type one one in the chat room. If you have your beacon paper ready, um, please uh, type one one. If you have your beacon paper ready, type one one in the chat room. Okay, thank you so much. All right, so in that, what we're going to do now is that we're going to design the steps and then with the steps, we design a form, a job safety form that we can use for analysis, safety analysis. That's, that's, those are the two things we, we are going to do now. We look at the steps, then from the steps, we'll now design the form for job safety um, analysis, right? Okay, so the, the first thing to do in job as analysis is number one, identify the job identify the job, or you could say job identification. So what categorically do you want to do? Identify the job, right? Identify the job. Number two, break down the job into tasks. Break down the jobs into tasks. Break down the job into tasks or steps. Break down the job into tasks or steps. Then number three, Identify the hazards in each task. 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 Then the fourth one, control the hazard. Control the hazard. Then finally, recommendations, recommendations, recommendations. I will go through it again. The first step is identify the job that you want to do. Uh, the second step is break down the job into tasks. And then number three, um, identify the hazards in each task. And then number four, put up controls to the hazards in each of the tasks. And then number five, create a review. Let there be a review. or recommendations, review or recommendation. Okay, so now how do we create um, a, a job safety sheet or job safety um, analysis form? 
Now, if you can draw on your paper, it's just simple as we just listed them. So the first thing on your form should be uh, the title of the work or project or job that you want to do. Then you have the names of the team members that are going to be conducting uh, the project and the name of organization you're conducting it for. And then the objective of the uh, JHA, these are preliminary aspects of the form. There is going to be the name of the project or the name of the task, or sorry, the name of the job you're doing. Then number two, the name of the organization or department you are doing that JHA on need to also be included. Then the name of the team members conducting the JHA should also be included in the cover of your form. Then the date of that JHA assessment should also be covered. Then in the main form, you now have column one, tasks. Column one, tasks. Column two, hazards. Column three, control. And column four, recommendations. Column one, the tasks. Column two, the hazards in each of the tasks. Column three, control, hazard control, and column four, recommendations. Please, who got that? If you got that as listed, please type uh, zero zero in the chat room. If you got that as listed, please type zero zero in the chat room. Okay. For those of us that got it, maybe you can help us put it in the chat room so that those that didn't get it can get it. Thank you so much for getting it. So we are going to take um, an assignment. And this assignment will be submitted in third week. So by the time we are grouped, we know that we already have an assignment. And the number one assignment that the group should be doing is to conduct a JHA on any job of their choice. And they're going to make a presentation on that. So you're going to use the form as your safety uh, analysis tool. It could be in your workplace, it could be in your family as your team decides, okay? So by, the, by next week we are grouping and by the third week we are starting with um, assessment and group work. So the first assignment that each group will have is a JHA report, a JHA report. Most of the JHA reports, um, well, when we, when we get the reports, we will look at it very critically because as a safety officer, you must know how to conduct a JHA. You must know how to prepare a JHA report because it's very, very important. Some of the reports we do get, they are missed. So instead of JHA, somebody is doing risk assessment, which are two different things, all right? They are two different things. So by next weekend, we are grouping ourselves. By next weekend, you should already know your group. By the third week, your first assignment as a group is to conduct a JHA on any job of your choice. Please note, job, not department, job. JHA focuses on jobs, so it's specific, all right? It's not generic. That's one of the differences between JHA and uh, risk assessment, okay? Okay, now, before I, I said the assignment will be on conducting a JHA assessment on any job of your choice, but that will be done in a team and that assignment will begin by next weekend. So by next weekend, you see your group, and then from there, we can go breaking, we can go working as in um, group, okay? So that, that will be the first assignment, all right? Okay, so before I go to the next uh, thing, um, do I have any question on, uh, on JHA? You don't understand um, the 
the concept or you don't understand how it's going to work, or how it's working or how it works, please you can just ask me your question now. You don't understand JHA, JHA, JSA, JSI, they are just the same thing, all right? If you don't understand it, please, you can just uh, tell me in the chat room and um, I will. Okay, read one. What exactly don't you understand in the JHA? Let's start from there. Please, you can just lift your hand and uh, let's hear from you instead of typing. Just tell me exactly what you don't understand. Is it the concept or is it the practice? Okay, what you don't understand is the network is fluctuating. Okay. <laughs> All right, I get it now. Thank you so much. Um, let me go back and um, rewind. Go over the requirements again. Please. Um, is it a requirement for conducting um, a uh, Richard Chaja has a son. Oh, okay, okay. Please kindly unmute him. Let's hear from him. Okay. Uh, Richard, unmute your mic, please. Yeah, good morning. Go ahead, Richard. Yes, good morning, Mr. Richard. Uh, yeah, I'm calling from, I'm just talking from Ghana. Um, okay, are you the richest man in Ghana? Yeah, no, <laughs> not yet. <laughs> okay, please go ahead. My question is that uh, concerned about the DHA, who's mm -hmm. supposed to prepare the DHA? Is it a safety officer or supervisor or uh, the departmental supervisor? Because the most okay. my company, most when you go to the site, we prepare it and give it to the supervisor, the, uh, supervisor. To assign it to make sure the people understand the, the concept in the GH. But when you're in the factory, we give to the supervisor because he know the, the type of the hazard involved the work they are doing. So he and the team sit down and prepare it and submit to the safety department and we review it. So I want to know who support prepared. Is it a safety officer or practitioner or the departmental supervisor? Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Richie for that wonderful question. Okay, one of the um, safety, health and safety work out of 1974 is that safety is a shared responsibility. And there's what we call safety leadership. Okay, there's what we call safety leadership. Safety leadership is just the real management, uh, management structure of how safety should go. Importantly, it's important that supervisors get their officers and other safety team members to know how to generate these forms by themselves, okay, is very, very important. So, so that um, everyone will be aware of the concept and why the concept is being used. So during safety training, during safety drills, these things should be inculcated as part of the uh, skills that those in the safety team should have. Nonetheless, approval of the form should be done by the safety supervisor. For organizations that don't have a safety team, they can have an external safety practitioner to draft the form for them. But the person will have to teach them how to use the form also. Okay, so whether it is the team members that drafted the form and gave to supervisor to, to approve or the supervisor drafted and now taught the team members how to use it, both way is acceptable, but it depends all on the kind of safety leadership available to the organization. Some safety leadership will provide autonomy. The team members can do what they need to do uh, by their discretion and then get the supervisor to approve it. In some other cases, the supervisor have to do it and then get, send it to the team members, all right? So it depends on the safety leadership available to that organization, all right? Thank you so much, Mr. Rich. I guess you understood a little of what I meant. Please, if you, if you got what I mean, please kindly um, consent in the chat room. If what I said made sense to you, please consent in the chat room. Mm. Okay, um, Mr. Abraham is like, there are some questions in the chat room. Okay, let me, let me check. I'm seeing Ohoho, Elishin. Oh, 
Ogogo Elishi. Yes. Please, let's have his question or her question. That would purely administrative work. Okay. I'm listening, sir. Okay, okay, okay. You want me to read out the question? Yes, just read out the question so that we can all hear. Okay, he said, would purely administrative work, like making phone calls and paperwork and systems work, require JHA? I am sort, I am sort looking, I'm sort of looking for the risks in doing this seamlessly. Mm -hmm. Simple tax in comparison with engineering jobs. I take it again. He said, would purely administrative work like making phone calls and paperwork and system work require JHA? And he's sort of looking for risks for the risks in doing this seamlessly. This seamlessly simple tax in comparison to engineering jobs. Okay, thank you so much, um, oh, oh, oh. Okay, there question. are terms and conditions for using a JHA. Um, one of the terms and conditions for using a JHA is that before you start using a JHA on a particular job, that means the job would have had some um, characteristics as one, there is likelihood of very high risk um, on that particular job. Number two, there could be high, high risk of fatality also on that job. The job could have disastrous effect. The job could lead to um um debt if the jha is not carried out okay so where you have a simple um or perhaps according to you simple administrative works like making of phone calls and paperwork systems they might not really require jha but they will require default uh, risk assessment to them to find out the effect of all of those things to your health and to or the, also the uh, the effect on business goods but let's assume that your system is now shocking you. There is it's now transmitting electrical shock. You have to do a GHA before you continue that work. You have to do a GHA to find out the root cause of that particular event. Okay. Or let's say you now put your, your, phone, your phone by your ear and the phone is now red hot. It's hotter than normal. You, it's not advisable to continue making the call. You need to find out why is it that the phone is behaving that way because that attitude of or that characteristic of that phone at that moment is now a hazard to your body. Okay, so in simple administrative work where there are no deviations, things are working normally, you can do a simple risk overview analysis. But where there are now deviations, like I just mentioned, electrical shocks start coming up, uh, systems uh, start stop working, and um, phone, uh, phone start misbehaving, having technical issues. You have to conduct a GHA on those areas before you proceed. Please, Mr. Oho, Mr. or Mrs. Ohoho, Elishin, does this answer make sense to you? Please, let's read the second question, please, from Clement Abango, Abanobo. Sorry for if I didn't pronounce your name right, please. Sorry. Okay. Um, the second question, he said, is it recommended that a generic JHA be used to perform similar tax or rep repetitive tax? Okay. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes, I can hear you loud and clear. Okay, so is it is it uh, recommended that generic JHA be used to perform similar tasks or repetitive tasks? Okay, the 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 form can be generic, dependent on your organization, and it also could be specific, dependent on your organization. So if you have um, um, some sort of generic activities, there may be no need of developing um, different JHA for. Um, different job because at the end of the day, the format will still be the same. The, con the, the whole content of a GHA form is still the same, whether you're doing it on job A or job B, but the difference could be that the hazards you identify 
at the different jobs could be different. So the form can actually be generic. At the same time, you could decide to uh, make it um, um, specific, okay? That some forms may have recommendations, some form might not have recommendation. Some form might have consequences, some form might not have consequences. So it depends on your organization and how you want the, the, the JHA to be carried out. Okay. Please, Mr. Clement, does that make any sense to you? Mr. Clement Appan Obon. Does that make sense to you? Please, if it did make sense, kindly um, acknowledge in the chat room. Okay, could there be any other question? I was seeing one hand raised up, but the hand had gone down. Okay, someone is saying. Um, uh, we only have one hand, question. Uh, yes, uh, yes, go ahead. Okay, the question says please, you mentioned risk overview. What does that mean? All right, That's thank you so much, uh, Mr. Courage Adua. Risk overview is important that um, when you get to workplaces in the morning, you have a visual, visual risk assessment before you begin your work. So every morning you should do a risk overview. Check your environment, check your workplace and be sure that there are no um, threats to you. That's a simple way of talking about risk overview. Okay, from Mr. Clement, he said, yes, but looking at say changing light bulb at different rooms in a building, changing light bulbs at different room in a building. If, you're, if you want to create um, a generic form for changing light bulb. The job will be changing light bulb, changing light bulb. Now, if you want to now uh, make specificity to different rooms, why you are not create, why you are uh, on the location as is, you cannot state, okay, location, room number, this, 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 whatever floor, you stay that one, room number, so, 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 but the process of changing the bulb will definitely be the same. Except there is something different in your own organization where maybe changing of bulb in room A could be different from changing of bulb in room B. If there are differences, then your JHA should be developed to match those differences. Okay, your JHA should be developed to match those differences. Okay. Thank you so much. All right, so let me uh, proceed with, uh, with my class. Now, job safety instructions are the outcomes of job safety analysis. So after you might have carried out job safety uh, analysis, those things we call recommendations, they are now things that come out as an instruction. Do not do this or do that, okay? So let's assume changing of light bulb in this place. After conducting a JHA, uh, you find out that, okay, to avoid um, ele electrical shock, please, everyone should wear their gloves. Okay, so you now put it as an instruction. Ensure to put your glove while changing bulbs. Um, ensure to use step ladders. Don't use um, chairs. So those becomes instructions that will guide the effective and efficient uh, delivery of that particular task at, at all times, all right? Okay, so job safety instructions are commonly one of the outcomes of job safety analysis. Such instructions inform operators of specific risks at different stages of the job and advise him or her of the precaution to be taken. Then another tool in um, safety auditing, or another safety tool is what we call health, or perhaps hazard and effect management process. Hazards and effect management process. So there are three key words there, hazards and effect, then the management process. So in essence, you can just see that it's already categorized. So you have hazards, identification of hazards, then the effects of those hazards, and then how to control those hazards. That's the, sim the simple way I could just place it there. So if you're using a, a, a hemp to carry out um, um, a safety auditing, you just have to identify the hazard, um, find out the impact of those or the consequences of those hazards, and then the control. And then you can also look at recovery. The one of the management processes could be looking at the recovery, okay? 
Now, why uh, job hazard analysis is focusing on jobs? GHA is not really focusing on job. GHA is much more is wider than job hazard analysis. All right. So uh, hemp asks the following questions: Are people, environment, or assets exposed to potential harm? That's identification of the hazard. Then, uh, what are the causes, consequences, and risks involved? That's the assessment of the hazard. Then, can the causes be eliminated, or what controls are needed? That's the control. Can the potential consequences or effect be mitigated, or are uh, recovery capabilities suitable and sufficient? That's now talking about the recovery. And I'm going to use uh, a typical example of um, what I saw at the uh, uh, Nigerian Seven or Bottling Company and uh, Nigerian Coca Cola Bottling Company, right? Nigerian Bottling Company. Seven or Bottling Company and Nigerian Bottling Company, yes. So some years ago, I think that should be around 2008 or nine. I found myself in Seven Up, and um, before then, let's say in the two thousand early two thousand, and before the two thousand, Seven Up was not into water production. There were massive waste, liquid waste. I remember one of those days, the production manager told me that they produce about 75, or they use about 75,000 liters of water every day. And out of that 75,000 liters, over 1,500 liters are wasted, okay? 1,500, can you imagine 1,500 liters? Just imagine it. That's like one tanker of water. They are wasted, okay? So at a point, they recruited uh, this young man, the Koshola. Shola was a, um, a geologist, at the same time, a food scientist, at the same time, a biochemist. He did three courses in the university, at the, all at degree levels. Uh, he had first class in, um, uh, in food science, uh, two one in geology, and then two one in biochemistry. So when they brought him to 7up, he was the person that brought up the use of hemp in that company. Okay. Now, what did Shola do? I'm just going to tell you what Shola did. Shola reformed the risk recovery plan of 7up that at the end of the day, they started producing things like aqua fina, aqua H2O. Those were the products of um, Shola's um, brain work. Now, while, while I was speaking with Shola on this particular case, one, the 1,500 liters of water that used to be waste before, they created a water purification plant inside the seven up plant and they use activated charcoal and other super chlorination approaches for the purification of the water. So before the water could get to the bottling station, it is already super fine uh, portable water. Now, I asked Shola a question. I said, Shola, there is no way you can have efficiency of one. So how do you manage the other water that get to be leaked out? And Shola said something to me. He said, uh, the water that leaks from this water plant um, are now channel two. They have a fish pond we are the um, grow catfish inside the same seven or plant. Now, I thought that, okay, so what will now happen to the water that you will dispense from the fish farm? Because obviously the water will still come up. It's okay, the water will be used as irrigation source for the vegetable farm they also have inside the same place. Now, if you look at this, the 1,500 wet water was redirected to a, 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 a water purification chamber. The water purification chamber processes the assumed waste water and, and gets the portable water that they sell. And then from the little drops that now get to exit from the water purification chamber, they get to have 
to push it to the the what, what it, the catfish farm. Then from the catfish farm, they turn the water to as irrigation to the vegetable farm. So you see, to some extent, they recovered the waste and they reduced um, the the one thousand the. If, uh, they reduce the production of 1,500 liters of wastewater every day to about 1,500 liters of bottled water every day. Okay, so those, that is a, a typical example of what hemp can do in an organization. Now, I also saw something that they did um, in that particular uh, organization that I so much appreciated. And what was that? You know, in, in, in food um, production with respect to beverages, there is a stage we'll call, um, is it carbonation? Where, um, like when, when, when you open coke, anytime you hear, you open coke, I hear shh, that's the result of carbonation. Uh, you open mortar and you see that all of those things are products of carbonation. So we use carbon dioxide to carbonate drinks. That's why it's called carbon, uh, carbonation. Now, in the same plant, they used to produce effluents, gas effluents, carbon, uh, carbon monoxide, sulfuric oxide, and other oxides that were not necessarily useful to them. All right, so I asked the question again, so how do you people now deal with the case of uh, these gases that are um, serving as effluents to the atmosphere, of which we all know that they have um, effects, greenhouse effects uh, on the environment. And uh, he took me to a place where they have a purification chamber, carbon purification chamber. So he was explaining how it works. All the sources of those gases are channeled towards a purification chamber. Now from those purification chambers, they separate them, they separate all the gases. So they, for the ones of carbon monoxide, they send them to a chamber where at the end of the day, it will be processed and stored as carbon dioxide. Then for the methane gases and all of that, they had to push those ones to the areas where they could process to cooking gas. Then for the sulfuric as, uh, gases and, um, and uh, lead oxide gases. They also separated them where they'll be useful. So if you look at it categorically, at the end of the day, they stopped. They were no longer buying um, or importing uh, carbon monoxide for the purpose of carbonation because now they can actually produce their own carbon dioxide for carbonation, drink carbonation. All right, so in a way they've reduced cost, they've reduced waste. Okay, they've reduced cost and they've reduced waste. So you see how hemp can go a long way in giving a very good foundation to organizational growth and development. All right, so the first thing is to identify the hazards, identify the consequences or make an, uh, an assessment on the consequences. What will these hazards cause? And then what will be the control? Don't just stop at the control. Now go further to now asking yourself, what can this, West, or what can this this particular thing that is coming out now? What can it serve as to be a raw material for? Okay, what can it serve as to be a raw material for? Okay, so let's take for instance, uh, you produce um, um, what what can we what can we use on it as a case now? Um, Okay, let's assume you produce palm kernel oil, vegetable oil from palm kernel. Okay, so can someone tell us um, what could be the hazards associated with palm kernel production, like the waste possibly coming out? And then what could be the consequences of those hazards? And then what could be the possible controls? And what could be the possible recovery? Okay, what could be the possible recovery from those hazards? Now, please feel free to type that in the chat room. I know it's a long one, but feel free to type that in. Just identify one hazard. This is one hazard in in go in uh, palm palm uh, or vegetable oil production. Okay, generally let's use, let's use vegetable oil. So this is one hazard. This is the consequence or the impact. 
This is the control, and this is how it can be recovered for better purposes. All right. So let me have your beautiful um, suggestions in the chat room. But meanwhile, is there anyone that have, uh, or you don't understand the hemp approach? If you don't understand it, please uh, go ahead and um, let me know, and then I will explain it more. You don't understand the hemp. Um, I, will, I will explain it again. The difference between hemp, the major difference between hemp and um, and job hazard analysis is that job hazard analysis is focusing on the job and the tasks in the job. Why hemp is focusing on the hazards, the consequences they bring, the control and the recovery. Okay, and the recovery, the, the other positive side of the management of the risk or the hazard that is coming out from the, the, the activity, okay? Okay. Okay, somebody say, I don't understand him. Okay. <laughs> uh, Okawa, Ferdinand, Chidera, please try and understand it. It's just as simple as um, the JHA we also did. Okay, so let's, let's go back, let's go back. Um, let's let's bring hemp to what we do in our house. I think maybe it will help. Before we come to the industry landscape, let's come to what we do now. Let me ask a question. How many of us here in your house, once in a while, you have leftover foods? Maybe you cooked rice, you didn't finish it that day. Okay, so you have to take it over to the next day. How many of us ever experienced that in our houses? I, I have that in my house. So if you experience that in your house, can you type one, one? Can you type one, one? Okay, so. Okay, so if you experience that in your house, so automatically, automatically, that food is already a hazard. It can become a waste. It can be recovered. So let's look at it in the two ways. One, if it were to be a waste, how do we manage it? Okay, if we can recover it, how do we manage it? So if it is a waste, like some people, some people can't eat food that stays overnight. Some people cannot just eat it. If they eat it, they go to hospital, all right? Or if they eat it, uh, they start, their body starts scratching them. <laughs> I've heard from quite a number ago, they tell you that they cannot eat a soup twice. Like they can only eat soup once, they eat stew once, everything they are eating is once. I say, well, you people need to start uh, appreciating hazard and effect management. Product. Okay, so the food waste, the, the assumed waste food or leftover food is a hazard which can be spoiled. When it's spoiled, what is the consequence? You would have lost money, right? You would have consequences, there'll be loss of money. Consequences, there is a possibility that someone could eat the food and have stomach upset and all of that, all right? That's if the food is not well uh, preserved. Consequences, um, which other consequence? Please help me with the other consequences. Now, what control can we put? Okay, so we can put the food in the fridge or in the freezer, depending on what we are putting. We can warm the food and make sure that it doesn't get stale. Okay, then the next day we'll warm it again and eat it, right? So that is a, that is a control. And the recovery there is, Instead of throwing the food away, we now bring the food through the fridge or through the freezer, warm it again, and it still serves a better purpose for us. Now, to some people who might not um, want to eat the food, there could also be another way of recovering the food. How do I mean? You can serve the food to livestock. By serving the food to livestock, you would have also reduced the cost of of servicing or maintaining or managing your livestock. To some of us, you're depending, dependent on the volume of waste they are producing. Some of these uh, agri people, they go around and buy those waste for their own livestock as well. So there are possible ways of recovering the waste instead of just bundling it and go and discarding it in a waste bin. By discarding it in a waste bin, we are not really practicing the most effective uh, um, way of managing that um, uh, that waste or that hazard at that moment. 
All right. So with the simple um, illustration of what we, we have in the house, we can see that we have every home. I may not know in every other country, but most of the homes in Nigeria will have a, a default hemp or hazard and effect management process in place. We'll just have that, especially as regards to kitchen. Even to our wardrobes, we do have it. Okay, so you have used the cloth over and over again. What is the, in your wardrobe, what is the hazard? You have overused clothes, one. What is the consequence? The consequence is that maybe it might not really be looking good on you. It might not suit your style and your level of life again. What is the control? The control is change your wardrobe. But how do you recover the ones that are, you could sell it off to people who might not be at the same class as you are. You can give it out to people who might not be at the same class as you and they'll still appreciate it. Okay, so we all practice all of these uh, things in the house, in our homes. So in the same way, in the organization, we also practice these things in the organization. Okay, we also practice these things in the organization. Okay, let me ask a question. How many of us here have worked in an organization where we use plenty oil, vegetable oil? Maybe you, you, you are into frying of chicken. Fry, you just fry, there is something always to fry. Of course, at the end of the day, that overused oil becomes a waste somehow. But let me know if there is anyone here that is in that industry of frying or, or that field of frying, how do you manage the overused oil? Do you just go and pour it out in the environment? How do you manage it? If there is anyone who does um, that kind of business, maybe you're into pastries and the likes, Maybe you could tell us, even in the home, we have overuse oil, especially during Christmas or, or salad. We have a lot to fry. So after you fry, you could have one bucket of oil that you, you feel like you don't need to use again. So how do you manage that? Let me have the answers in the chat room. All right, so with this, um, the hemp, does it make any meaning now to anybody? If you understand the hemp, um, where, where is... Um, the people that say they don't understand. Can I see you? Uh, Okawa, please, do you understand it now? Do you understand the hemp? Okay, thank you so much. Okay, so if there's any other person that doesn't understand Sorry, hemp. Dr. Bonito, please put noise on your mic. Sorry? Yeah, there's a little noise on your mic, on your mic. Okay. What was the noise like? Is it like an echo or what? Hello. Mm. Yes, I said, what's the noise like? Is it like an echo or what? No, as you speak, it makes it makes that noise. Okay, like cracking. Just a distorted noise. Okay. So let me be sure yes, that this voice is like okay. That. okay okay thank you so let me work on my voice and come back <clears throat> all right is it better off now Please, if my voice is loud and clear, please can you help me type one one in the chat room? If it's loud and clear, please let me type one one in the chat room. If it's still distorted, please let me know. All right, thank you so much. And thank you, Mr. Abraham for calling my attention to that. Okay, someone asked a question. I said, uh, uh, the, format of, um, the format of hemp, yes. The same way we develop the format for JHA, we can also develop the same format for hemp. Okay, the same format for hemp. So you have um, the organization you're carrying now, the hazards, hazard analysis on, then the, the team members and all of the first things that apply on hemp. Then you now come to now have column one hazard, column two consequences or implications or assessment which will now tell us the impact of those hazards, okay? And then you have column three control and then column four recovery, okay, recovery, all right? 
So that's um, the same way we can create the, the two. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. We are gradually uh, coming to the close of today's class. I can see already that is um, after 11 or after 10 for those of us in Ghana. Um, okay, so let's look at risk assessment in a bit. I'm only going to introduce risk assessment. We have a class for risk assessment. So when we get to risk assessment, we'll look at it in a whole. Risk assessment is a safety tool which ensures that business risks are identified, assessed, and control measures put in place. Now look at um, the key word there. Um, a safety tool which ensures that business risks, business risks, business risks are identified, assessed, and controlled measures put in place. A technique for preventing accidents and ill health looks at what could go wrong and ways to prevent them. Risk assessment provides the basis for enabling um, actions to be identified and taken to eliminate hazards or to minimize their effects. Identifying hazards and assessing the risk of the hazard uh, occurring allows us to be proactive and not reactive. So risk assessment is a proactive way of managing business risk. Now, someone has a question of what do I mean by risk overview, that every day you go to work, you need to conduct a, 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 a review of risk in your workplace or do a primary risk survey in your workplace before you continue. What the, one of the essence of that is to be sure that there is no uh, possibility of risk coming up. Now, if there are possible risks coming up, you have to note them down. And in this case, if, if you look at GHA and HEM, they focus more on the technical aspect of um, hazards and risk in the workplace. But if you look at risk management, it, is, it gives a broader view, okay? It gives a broader view. Like now, if we're conducting a GHA on installation of um, maybe installation of 200, um, um, 200 uh, megawatt of uh, powerhouse station, let's assume we are doing that. And um, the risk assessment will, sorry, uh, job asset analysis will focus more on the technical aspect and then it will not pay some um, instance to the people side as to things like um, insults, bullying, um, harassment and all of that. But in a general risk assessment that will be covered, those things will be covered, okay? The general risk assessment those areas will be covered. Now, in conducting a GHA, you may not have to consider market feasibility as part or, or the report of market feasibility as part of the things you need for your GHA or HEM. But for, no, you might need it for HEM, but GHA, no. Uh, but for risk assessment, you will need those things to ensure that your business is well positioned. All right, so when we say risk overview, it might not necessarily mean just your work environment only. Risk overview can also be, what is the market saying? What are the customers saying? What are the stakeholders saying? What are the investors saying? What is the bank saying? The lenders, what are they saying? The creditors, what are they saying? Those things now form a majority of the risk. What is technology saying? What are governments, what is government saying? What are the industry standards saying? These things now form a bulk of the risk. Most of the risk will now be assessed using GHA or hemp. But on a general view, it gives you a broader view of what risk are expected in your business. All right. Does that make sense to anybody? What I just explained now, please, if you understood it, please kindly type zero zero in the chat room. If you understood what I just said now, Please type 00 in the chat room. Let me be sure you're following. If you don't understand, let me also know. Okay. If you don't understand, let me know. Okay. I'm only seeing 100. Does it mean I should repeat it again? It's only one person that understood me. Okay. Two persons now understood me. Three persons. Okay. Four persons. Okay. So if you didn't understand it, just type zero 01 
So it's partly understood, partly not understood. If you didn't understand it, I just type zero one. Uh, remember I said, we are still going to have a class that will, um, that will give us a complete breakdown of how risk assessment and risk management work. Okay, so for those of us that are saying zero one, thank you so much for being quite sincere. Okay, so let's go back to what risk assessment is. Now, let's get it clearly. Most often, when you want to submit a business plan, they will ask you of your risk assessment plan, or they will ask you to do a SWOT analysis, which is a tool for risk assessment, all right? They will ask you for uh, things like your contingency plan, which is also uh, the same thing as risk plan. If you're doing a project, they ask you for your risk plan, they ask you for your contingency plan or the likes. All of them are all the same thing. Whether you call it risk plan, contingency plan, uh, 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 uncertainties plan, they are just talking about the same thing, all right? So to ensure that your business is in the right position at all times, risk management or risk assessment helps us to identify, assess, and control, uh, put control measures to identify the risks to our businesses. Okay, and I said, why risk assessment provides a general overview of business risks? JHA and HEM tends to be more technical. They focus more on the technical sides of businesses than the general overview of businesses. Do you, do you get that now? Do you get that? Okay, so if you're going to be doing a JHA on, um, on uh, Bob, maybe changing of Bob, right? Like someone rightly said, you don't need uh, a risk assessment of what the feasibility study of the changing the, the, the bulb will be in the marketplace. That will not be accommodated in your JHA. But in your risk assessment, it will be accommodated. What will be the impact of the light to work? What will be the impact of the light to production? If customers are going to be found within this area, what will be the impact of the color of the light and all of that? That will be contained as a general risk assessment. But in changing the bulb, technically, we will not consider those things. Your own is, as soon as the risk assessment says, okay, put this bulb here, your own is technically find out the best way to put it to avoid errors. So risk assessment gives us a general overview of risks within our businesses and then help us to assess those risks and then put control measures to those risks, okay? Let's take, for instance, again, that your company um, needs um let's say you need um, a machinery um, to commence production or you want to change your machinery for production purposes um the job asset analysis will focus more on how do we procure the machine from where we are getting it from transport it to our company and install it that's what job asset analysis will focus on but risk analysis will focus on how do we get the money who will fund it what will be the impact of the machine to the business as to the growth and development of the business? What will be the impact to business sustainability and continuity and all of that? How will that better customer satisfaction? So you look at it generically, risk assessment is taking a look at the relationship between your business and the environment. But job as an analysis majorly is focusing on the internal dimensions of your business. Okay, now, did you understand that? I know you're reading my, my, my screen. Now, a risk management provides the basis for enabling actions to be identified and taken to eliminate hazards or minimize the effect. Identifying hazard and assessing the risk of the hazard occurring allows us to be proactive rather than reactive. It gives consideration to the degree of harm and the number of people who may be affected and the likelihood of the harm. Now, what are the objectives of risk assessment? Um, as I, I, I push on, please. Uh, for those of us that once typed one one, if you understand it better now, please, can you type zero zero so that we can continue? If you typed one one and you, zero zero one, and now you think you understand it better, please type zero zero, then we can proceed. All right, thank you so much. All right, so if you don't still understand it, don't worry. We'll get to a risk management class and that will be more of the eye opener and then you could understand it more because you definitely have to carry it out, okay? Objective of risk assessment, identify potential economic vulnerability, identify hazardous situations and procedures, provide um, 
uh, uh, knowledge of patterns of events and identify critical parts of the operation. Now look at look at the first objective of risk assessment: economic vulnerability. Identify potential economic vulnerability. So it's telling you that it's much more centric on the business as regards to profitability, uh, productivity, uh, customer satisfaction, and and all of that. It's not really looking at the 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 technical aspect of how do we install machines and all of that but when you carry out a jha it gives you that so jha in a way is also part of risk assessment so i, I would not want us to divorce that okay jha hemp they are also a component of risk assessment in the workplace all right so it, it also identifies hazardous situations and procedures where which is now where jha and hemp now comes to play then it provides knowledge of patterns of events and critical identify critical parts of the operation to provide information required to make decisions on whether the level of risk is tolerable that is whether the hsc risk can be managed to the level as low as reasonably practicable then compare alternatives particularly in the design phase then optimize the use of scarce resources money people and time so if you look at it it's all encompassing then to also help meet regulatory requirements that's one of the reasons why we conduct a risk assessment. Possible types of risks that were experienced could be potential loss of life, assets, production time, or injury, potential impact on health, especially illness and disease and environment. There were potential loss of assets and reputation. All of these could be um, categorized as types of risk we see in the workplace. Now, what's the procedure for risk assessment? We have identified, avoid, measure, assess, apply controls, then document and review. Assessment should be reviewed from time to time to ensure that control measures continue to be effective and appropriate. A review should be made when changes to the workplace occur, such as new equipment and so on. Okay, I'm seeing something from the chat room. Someone says that my screen is blank. So please, if my screen is uh, showing hierarchy of controls in your own place, please type one one in the chat room. If you're seeing hierarchy of controls and all of them, please type one one. And if your if your screen is blank, type zero zero. If your screen is blank, type zero zero. If you if you can see what I'm sharing, type um, one one. Okay, so uh, the one ones have it. Please, those that have zero zero, please check your check your device and be sure that your network is still in order. So, what do we have as hierarchy of controls in risk? In, in risk control, we have general classification of controls. We have the engineering controls. We have administrative controls. Then we have PPEs. Okay, general general um, engineering controls, administrative controls. Then we have PPEs. All right. In the general in the uh, um, um, engineering controls, we have things like um, uh, substitution, isolation, um, enclosure, local ventilation as part of engineering controls. Then in um, administrative controls, we can use elimination, we can use good housekeeping, exposure time reduce, and training and welfare facilities as part of administrative controls. They will have PPEs as standalone. I will, I will repeat that again. We have engineering controls, um, um, administrative controls, and uh, uh, PPEs, that's personal protective equipment. So examples of, um, based on this hierarchy we have here, examples of um, um, engineering controls could be substitution, isolation, enclosure, local ventilation, okay? That could be engineering controls. Then on administrative control, we could have elimination, um, good housekeeping, exposure time reduced, training and welfare facilities. They will have PPE as a standalone, all right? So in the hierarchy of control, this is how the, the hierarchy should go. First, elimination is the first. We should try as much as we can to eliminate uh, risks. Remember, when we are talking about eliminating risks, it's more often on the negative risks, not the positive risks, where we eliminate negative risks. So elimination is the first thing. Followed by substitution, then isolation, enclosure, uh, local ventilation, good housekeeping, exposure time reduced, training, 
and PPE than welfare facilities. So welfare facilities should be the least um, um, control measure to be employed in risk management. Okay, we'll be using this um, risk assessment matrix. When we get to risk um, management, we'll get to use this as a way of uh, reading risks and then understanding how risks uh, are managed. All right, okay, so this, this um, table shows the whole definition of risk. One, risk is the likelihood of an event occurring and the severity when it occurs, right? So in essence, we will say risk is a likelihood of an event occurring multiplied by the severity when it occurs. So from this table, you will see severity levels from zero to five. Then you see likelihood levels from A to E. Then you see um, the consequences, the elements that are possibly going to be bearing the consequences. So you have people asset environmental reputations. Then you have uh, the definition uh, of what the likelihood A to E mean. And then you have the, like, the, the meaning of the severity on each of these um, elements under the consequence levels. Then you now have a decision, uh, uh, decision um, apartment where you have blue, yellow, and red, okay? We are blue is um, accept, yellow is tolerate, and red is reject, all right? So if we are going to take um, a little example here, let's take this example and then let's see how um, it, will, it will help us. A mechanical digger severed a life 415 volt underground cable to the workshop while excavating to lay water pipes. There were no injuries. The risk assessment is as follows. The worst credible consequence could have been electric electrocution of the digger, that's one person. The incident has been heard of in the uh, oil and gas industry, that's probability B. The consequence category is um, people, and then the severity is four. Then the risk assessment um, presentation will be B4P. All right. Uh, please note, this table is not only oil and gas that is useful, all right? This is just a case of oil and gas. It could be a tourism industry. It could be aviation industry. It could be education industry. It could be telecom industry. Just change it to suit what your own industry is, all right? So for this case study we are having here, the mechanical digger severe the 415 underground cable to uh, the workshop while excavating to lay water pipes. There were no injuries. So how do we then represent this, um, this uh, calculation or how do we represent it uh, on the risk, um, risk format? So first, what is the severity level? So the, 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 the identified risk is electrocution, but the, the case has already told us that nobody died. So the worst case scenario is electrocution, which is one person with the digger dying. So we have our severity as four and the, the consequence level is on people. So under people, we have four, which means one to three fatalities. Assuming there was going to be fatality, it's going to be one to three fatality because there was only one person involved in the excavation, right? Then what will be the probability? I said the probability is that it has been heard of in the oil and gas industry, maybe in that particular, in your own industry has been heard of. So when you read it down, when you read from B down and you read from for the other way, it will intercept at the yellow side, yellow um, side of the acceptance chart. I hope you are seeing the yellow side, right? So when you read, when you draw B down, it will come to yellow. The point where A, if you draw the line from four straight horizontally and draw the line B vertically, both will intercept at the yellow regions, all right? So if you're presenting this first, you present um, the probability of happening because uh, the, the formula said likelihood of occurring multiplied by consequence, right? Likelihood of occurring multiplied by consequence. So your first there is the likelihood, which is B. The severity or the consequence is four and the major element is affecting is people. So you have B4P. So with that, 
anybody that knows how to risk, read the risk table, by seeing this, you see, you, the person will notice that, okay, this is a risk that is often or been heard of in the industry and it's very useful and it's affecting people. Okay, if it were to be A, that means B for A, that means affecting the asset. If it were to be E, it's affecting the asset. Environment, if it were to be R, is affecting the reputation. So it can be on any of the elements. It mustn't be on people only. All right. Okay. So do I have um, any question to this? Do I have any question to this table? We will still get to understand this table more when we delve into risk, risk management. Um, it's just to read the intersections. What, what is it affecting? What's the severity? Then you read it across to uh, the likelihood table and then draw your likelihood vertically, draw your um, consequence horizontally. There must be a point. If it's at the red region, then it means... Uh, <laughs> oh God. Somebody said, I didn't understand the table at all. <laughs> Okay, just calm down. You understand the, the table. Okoje, Opesia, Roland. The table is simple to understand. And somebody said, how about P4C? Okay, if you say P4C, you're changing the, the sequence. Nonetheless, it's important to understand how your own organization presents the ask. But if you're using the general risk formula of uh, likelihood multiplied by uh, severity, and then the likelihood has to come first. Then the severity will come second. I'm talking to Boma Irimaha, okay? Irimaha. So you, you following the, the risk, uh, risk formula, which is likelihood multiplied by severity, that will help. Okay, so for those of us that, that are yet to follow, can you do something for me? Please, can you write on your paper so that we, we do it um, in a simple way? Can you write on your paper, risk is equal to likelihood of uh, an event occurring or likelihood of a risk occurring multiplied by the severity of the risk when occurred. Can you write that down? Then you write the formula, risk is equal to L multiplied by S. And that will help us. And I would like you to visualize um, this table alongside with me. Okay, just visualize as though we are in the same class and I'm in front of you. And then I'm, I'm now explaining this table in your very before. Okay, I'm explaining it in your very front. The formula is likelihood of risk occurring multiplied by the severity of the risk after it had occurred. So likelihood multiplied by severity, that's the formula. Okay, likelihood multiplied by severity, that's the formula. Okay, so we are taking a case study, and this case study happens to be in oil and gas. So the chart um, is now, the likelihood is now referring more as to what happens to oil and gas. All right, now, if that table, or if that formula works very well for us, you remember that safety elements that are most affected are people, environment, assets, and reputation. So you have the severity column here, you have the consequence column, okay? So on the severity, you have a, a rate of zero to five. On the consequence, you have the people, assets, environment, and reputation. Then on the interpretation of these consequence levels or severity levels on the consequences, zero has a meaning across the elements, one, two, three, up to five. So zero says on people, no health effect or injury was caused, number one, says slight health effect or injury. Number two, minor health effect or injury. Number three, major health effect or injury. Number four, one to three fatalities. Number five, multiple fatalities. So that's um, a definition that had been given to the severity levels. Okay, and please note, this is just a generic um, risk assessment matrix um, board. So you can also modify it to suit what happens around your own organization, right? So we are using this case study of a mechanical digger that want to lay underground water pipes. And in the process, he severed 415 volts of underground um, cable, which could have resulted to an electrocution. So it, there was a near miss that occurred. The near miss is that nobody died. Although he is, is, is excavated or he severed 415 volts of electrical cable, but no one died. So the incident happened, 
but there was no accident. So it was a near miss. So the question now is how do we interpret this event using the risk matrix uh, table or risk assessment matrix table? How do we interpret that? Now, consequence, bef sorry, before we go to consequence, the likelihood one is A, never heard of in the oil and gas industry. If that is the, uh, the, the likelihood, then you write it first, A. But in this case, it has been heard of in the oil and gas that yes, once in a while, uh, we'll find the excavators who want to do things, get uh, life cables out in the oil and gas. So it has been heard of. So you write your statement B, B, B. Then the next one is what is now the severity? The severity says, if there was going to be electrocution, the only person that could have died is the digger, right? The digger is the only, so the fatality is between one to three. So the severity that accommodates one to three from the severity table is four. So four on people means one to three fatalities. One to three fatalities. So, so you write four. And the next thing is, which element is it affecting? The element is affecting is B. Why did we bracket the B? Is to indicate that the consequence of um, uh, the risk are having the possibility of B at uh, uh, severity of four is on this element. So you have to put that bracket. You have to put that bracket. And according to your organization too, there are organizations that as risk start moving from three upward, they start putting asterisks on the four. So you see four asterisks. That's to show you that that risk is a critical risk. It can lead to, anytime you see um, risk, um, uh, um, I'll put it now. risk presentation and is showing you asterisks for some organization that put asterisk. It's already telling you that that particular risk can result to loss of life. So you have to be careful about it. Okay. All right. Um, now, this table did not tell us, or this formula, or uh, this um, uh, calculation did not tell us whether we should accept it, tolerate it, or reject it. So with this particular formula, we can now go to the acceptance region where we are seeing blue, yellow, and red, and decide whether we will accept it or reject it. So if you read from B downwards, just draw from that B downwards, then draw from, um, from four horizontally, it's going to meet at the yellow region. And that yellow region is helping you decide that this risk is tolerable. So you can tolerate it, but make sure you put enough mitigation measures to avoid death. Okay, so it's tolerable. If you read it horizontally and vertically, just draw B down, draw from four, but uh, horizontally, it will come to the, the, the point of intersection will be at the yellow axis at the acceptance region. Okay, is there someone now that understood <laughs> this risk chart? Okay, is there someone that understood the risk chart? If you didn't understand the risk chart, please let me know. Okay, I said the colors B is acceptable risks. Yellow is tolerable risks. Red is reject. Blue is risks that are acceptable. Yellow are risks that are tolerable. Red are risks that need to be rejected. Okay. And if you look at all the, all the uh, things that happen around red. So if you start from, uh, from, from three, where you read from three and then you start having intersection um, E. So you see there are major health injuries to people, major health effect and injuries to people. So at E, where it happens several times per year in a location, they will tell you reject it. It shouldn't happen several because if it's happening several, what it means that one day we'll not even have staff. One day our customers may even become the target. So we should reject that. Then you also see four, when it start happening, um, happens several times per year in, a, in your company, that's like D, all right? So it's telling you reject. If it's coming to E, reject. The same thing applies to five. So as it's approaching to where the frequency is high and the severity is high, then you have to reject it. The frequency of occurrence is high and the consequence upon occurrence is high. Then you, find, you have to find a way to reject it. 
Okay. All right. Um, this this table I just explained now, does it make any sense? Okay, understood halfway. Don't worry, you'll soon understand everything. Okay. <laughs> Abu Bakr Sandy, don't worry, you'll soon understand everything. Please, um, if you can do me a favor, just go to your manuals and just try to understand this risk. Um, um, this risk table or risk assessment table. Just pay your pay attention to it. You definitely don't. It's, it's just simple. It's just a correlation of uh, um, what do you call it? Y axis and X axis. Okay. And if I can get a video that will explain this categorically, I will try and get it across to us so that we can all view it together. All right. Okay. So someone says one to two is safe, right? Yes, from the table, zero, one, two is safe. But you, you will notice that two at the levels of um, likelihood of um, D and E, it start turning to become intolerable. Okay, it, it start turning to become intolerable. So you also have to be very careful on that. Okay, though there may be minor health effects and minor injuries, but that could also result to lost time injury. Okay or lost time in the workplace, all right? Okay, um, please, let's go ahead and share the attendance. I just have uh, 10 minutes to round up this class. Please, coordinator, just go ahead and share the attendance. I didn't know that the time had gone this far. Okay, can I proceed, please? If I can proceed, please tell me, let me proceed. Yes, blue, accept, acceptable, yellow, tolerable, red, reject. What are the actual things done to show Acceptance, tolerance, and reject in real life. Okay, so the actual things that you need to do in cases of um, 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 reject or accept or tolerate, you'll find some practical safety things that we do. So for instance, you see a lockout, maybe for a place that is, is high with the risk, they will lock it completely out and ask people not to go there. So take, for instance, a transformer they will use an enclosure to tell you that this one, going close to this place is not acceptable. It's reject, you don't, don't ever try it. So they use um, uh, burglaries and use whatever means to enclose the transformer so that people don't go there. So that's actual real life uh, things we can do. Then also for some of us that use gas, gas cylinders, you get to now create uh, locks for your gas cylinder to avoid children playing with the locks and all of that. Okay, so that's also an actual uh, thing you can do. And in our workplaces too, it's tough for us to find out um, which of these, which of these, um, please permit me to go back, is for us to find out which of these um, control measures we should be using. Uh, is for us to find out which of these control measures we should be using, all right? Whether we should use elimination, substitution, and whichever one we want to use, they are all practical in our workplace. They are all practical in our real life. Okay, there are things you must eliminate. There are risks you must eliminate, all right? So let's take, for instance, anything that will cause you to die, definitely you want to eliminate it by all means, all right? Or even if you want to accept it, you must have had uh, enough analysis to ensure that even after you're dead, dead, the risk you accepted is going to help other lives, okay? All right, so we, we have to find out which of the control measures we can use at any of these levels. Um, in the risk chart, all right? Okay, if I can, pro if you want me to proceed, please tell me proceed because uh, time is up right now. Time is up right now. I just have seven minutes. Um, uh, sir, there seven. are two hands raised. There are two hands okay, raised. There, there are two, please kindly unmute them. Let's all have right. their questions. Okay. All right, Ferdinand, you can ask your question. Or meet your mic can ask your question. Ferdinand, Mr. Ferdinand. Mr. Ferdinand, are you the owner of this uh, uh, machine we are displaying here? <laughs> Please mute, 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 mute. Okay. 
Kindly unmute the other person, please. The noise in the background yeah. is like. All right, Mr. Yaya. This is Yaya Ahmad. Please unmute your mic and speak up. Mr. Yaya Ahmad. Please unmute your mic and speak up. Okay, it's like um, maybe their networks are okay. Their network will be having issue from their area. Uh, maybe I think so. All right, Ayama, please go ahead. Go ahead with you. It's possible he doesn't know his hand was up, so I think it's good we bring down the hand. Okay, sir. All right, uh, quickly then, uh, let me round up and then we will, we will go. So this is an example of um, a workplace. This is default to some of the things we see around us. So uh, what are the hazards we can see in this place? Please, can we spot out all the hazards um, in this work environment? Can we spot out all the hazards in this work environment? Please, let's use the chat room, spot them out, and then we can uh, uh, round up. Spot out all the hazards you're seeing here. Please, you can go ahead and spot out all the hazards. We are waiting in the chat room. Okay, so we see hand. No, no, no. I'm not talking about the consequences. I'm talking about the hazards. What are the things that can cause hand injury? Okay, so exposure of uh, rotating parts, good. The belt and chain, good. The motor and roto, rotator, rather. Thank you. Um, are we seeing any other thing? So the rotating parts can cause hand injury. The saw, great. The shaft. So we can, poor housekeeping, wonderful. Electricity, good. Chain, good. So we can see that uh, from here, we can do a simple um, hazard identification of what happens here. And I'm sure for each of the ones we just identified, we can actually put up the consequences, what it will cost, and then we can put up a control. So if, I, if, we're, if, if we're asked to do uh, a JHA here, um, we can do that with, um, with ease. We can do that with ease, all right? Okay, so all of the things we identified, they are all um, uh, part of the thing. So we see the belt. We see the, the shaft or the, the, the saw. <laughs> then we see the chains. We see the poor housekeeping, like somebody mentioned. We see the electrical parts. All right, so is there, is there a hazard? Now compare this to environment. Which one is more hazardous? Is it A, let's assume this is A, or this is B. So if you identify which one is more hazardous, can you tell us the consequence of the hazards that you see? So this is A and this is B. If it is hazardous, tell us the consequence of the hazard. Please, Mr. Abraham, can you please share the attendance again? Please, if you've not done your attendance, can you kindly type one one in the chat room? Okay. So is it A or B that is more hazardous? Just um, state A, is, is it more hazardous or less hazardous? A is more hazardous, okay. A. Okay, so the attendance link is going on as we are saying A, B, C, B, C, A. So please, as you're typing A. Okay, so what could be the possible consequence of, of A over B? What could be the possible consequence on the people now or the person? The consequence the person could get from working under A compared to when working under B. 
Okay, the person is susceptible to have his PPE clinched to the moving parts. Okay, that's great. Amputation, wonderful. A is highly hazardous. A safety guard was, the safety guard was removed. Okay. Um, so from the little we've seen here, there is possibility of court amputation, uh, dragging of the uh, PPE, which could lead to further injuries. Okay, so in everything we do as safety officers and wherever you work, please always note that safety first and safety last. If you're not safe, you cannot save others. So you must always remember that you must be safe to get others safe. Our work is never so urgent or important that we cannot take the time to do it safely. So as a safety supervisor, please keep that in mind. And whether you're a safety supervisor or not, please let's keep that in mind. All right, so our test is not for today. And this is um, where I'm going to call it a day. So if there is a question for me, please, can we kindly go ahead? But before we come back for questions, um, let's just take um, one minute to stretch out. Questions should do please exceed five minutes because we're already on top of 12 o'clock. So questions shouldn't exceed five minutes. So in the next five minutes, let's have all the hands, uh, sorry, in the next um, 30 seconds, let's have all the hands that need to be raised up. And then let's take all the questions from the chat room and from all the areas. Uh, so please, you can raise your hand if you have a question, just raise your hand and you'll be unmuted. If you have questions, do well to raise your hands and you'll be unmuted. Okay, so we have some hands up. We have Richard Asante. Please can we Richard. unmute him and take his question and then... Okay. My question, my question is there. On what basis uh, risk assessment can be reviewed. Sorry, can I get a question again? Yeah, I said on what basis risk mm. assessment can be reviewed? If I, risk assessment if, should be if, reviewed every day. Okay, risk assessment day. should be reviewed, yes. Because uh, risk can come up any moment. So risk should be reviewed daily. Okay, in fact, as a matter of, uh, if, if we really need to practice safety, Risks should be reviewed before work and after work. Okay, it should be reviewed before and after work. But when when now talking about risk assessment strategies, when should they be re, uh, reviewed? Okay, risk assessment strategies can be reviewed either monthly or weekly or annually based on your company standards. Some companies re review their their um, risk assessment strategies once every three years some review once every one year, and also based on the industry standards that come on board. Like now, some organizations use ISO 4501, some use ISO 1800, dependent on the one your company uses. As the updates keep coming, you also keep reviewing your risk um, practices. All right? Okay. Thank okay. you. Thank you. All right. Okay, so if there is no further question, can we go on break and resume by the next class? Please, Mr. Mr. Thompson, when is our next class for today? Okay, you mean the HSE class, huh? Yes, please. Okay, uh, so just give me a minute. Uh, Sorry, just a minute. Okay, from the time table here, it's looking like it's by 2 p.m. 2 p.m. Uh, 2 p.m. Because yes. we, you know, we have a class by one, a project management class by one. Uh, okay. Uh, project management class by one. 
I think, yeah, we, it's, it's 2 p.m. Sorry, 3 p.m. 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. 3 p.m. to 5 p.m. Are you sure your own time table and my own is the same? From my time table, I'm seeing 2 to 4.30. It's 2 to 4.30. Yeah, I Okay, please, can we kindly go and review our own timetables, please? I think that will help. But from my own timetable, I'm seeing three, 2 p.m. to 4.30. Um, 2 p.m. to 4.30. Okay, so okay, if there yes, is yes, no two, further question, two, we'll meet two, by 2 p.m. And uh, we'll continue. All right. Thank you so much for your time and see you by 2 p.m. By 2 p.m., some other announcement will be passed by. All right. So we we'll just have one hour in the afternoon. So 2 p.m. to project management will be one to two, and then safety will be two to, two to, okay, two to 4.30, all right. Then the evening class will be by okay. Thank you, everyone. Please ensure to sign your attendance. Is there anyone here who has not signed his attendance? Okay, so please, if you've not signed the attendance, can you please type one one in the chat room so that um, the coordinator can send you uh, the attendance link. If you've not signed the attendance, please type one one in the chat room. If you've not signed the attendance, please type one in the chat room. Okay, please, uh, Mr. Thompson, can you please send, resend the attendance again? Mr. Clement Chigebere has not signed the attendance. Oholo Elishin has not signed. Ohoho Elishin has not signed attendance. Okay, Mr. Mr. Abraham, are you still there? Can you please repost the attendance? Okay, it's wonderful. Just give me a moment, let me. Okay, so for those of us that have not signed attendance, please sign your attendance here. If you've not signed your attendance, please sign your attendance here. Is there anyone here who uh, has not subscribed to the YouTube channel? If you've not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please can you type one one in the chat room also? You've not subscribed to the YouTube channel, please type one one in the chat room. Okay, please, Mr. A.B., can you please um, send also uh, the WhatsApp, uh, sorry, the YouTube channel so that they can subscribe. Please, it's important that you subscribe to the YouTube channel because it will help you give you access to all the classes, both the ones you missed and the ones you attended. So you can always, um, you can always um, get to have access to the class any day, anytime. So please subscribe to the YouTube channel now. Very, very important, subscribe now. Okay, so if we have done that, um, we can say thank you for coming. See you by one o'clock. Please take your time, rest, uh, and then we'll see by, sorry, see by two o'clock, rather. All right. All right, thank you, sir. Thank, thank you so everyone. much. Thank you so mm. much. All right.